The day-to-day -day routine of Dr. Gears consisted of a few constants. Piping hot cups of black, unsweetened coffee, plain dry wheat toast, the soothing sounds of his favorite white noise machine, and the endless carousel of experiments with SCP-914. Not that he was complaining. He was perfectly content to spend his time supervising one of the few anomalies he crossed paths with on a regular basis that was unlikely to kill or maim him in any way. Not that the Clockworks hadn't produced its fair share of unpredictable results over the years of extensive testing, it had definitely offered up more than a few surprises. And anyone who knew Dr. Gears knew that he was not especially fond of surprises. Dr. Bright had attempted to throw a surprise birthday party for the man once, but when he turned on the lights and fired the confetti cannon, all Dr. Gears did in response was give a deep sigh and say, Really, Jack? You're making a spectacle of yourself. Still, he had resigned himself long ago to the fact that supervising the experiments with SCP-914 meant witnessing some truly unpredictable outcomes. How could he forget the time researcher Blas tested an incandescent light bulb on the setting very fine, and the machine spat out an anthropomorphic humanoid light bulb that spoke in German-accented English and claimed to be Thomas Edison himself? This was, of course, impossible, as historical records surely would have indicated if Thomas Edison was a walking, talking light bulb rather than a human man. The imposter was eventually incinerated after its presence became too irritating to ignore. And then there was the time researcher Thompson filled out a Dungeons & Dragons character sheet and placed it into the machine on the setting very fine. The output produced was a sheet of paper promoting the previously non-existent tabletop role-playing game Fear in the Foundation. Whenever a person read the paper, they would suddenly find themselves in an out-of-body experience where they were inside the game's world, which contained several characters related to the SCP Foundation, as well as items and locations based on real-world counterparts. A subject in this state would only snap back to reality after winning or dying in the game. Researcher Jacobson rolled a 1 on stealth and saw SCP-096's face in the game and was later found dead in the anomalous item storage wing. There was no shortage of Foundation staff trying to use the machine for personal gain, too. Dr. Naismith placed his credit card inside on the setting very fine, using it to produce a card covered in unidentified corporate insignias and reading, Rank Aleph Infinite Money Privileges. When Dr. Coltrane issued a written warning, Dr. Naismith took that warning and then placed it into the machine on the same setting, producing a piece of official documentation from the O5 Council in support of his infinite money privileges. Junior researcher Summers attempted to use SCP-914 in a misguided attempt at self-improvement, placing not an object, but herself in the intake booth before running the machine on the setting very fine. It cleared her skin, lengthened her hair, and improved her figure. This was, of course, in violation of several employee guidelines, and she was promptly dismissed after emerging from SCP-914. Dr. Veritas left a note in the experiment log following this incident, reading, By the time we realized what she was actually doing, it was too late to stop her. Needless to say, she's since been terminated, and I hope I don't need to tell you all not to do that again. And with that, the guideline was clear. No one was permitted to use SCP-914 for personal gain, or to change anything about themselves. Potential complications were too risky, not to mention the conflicts of interest that would be introduced into what should be an impartial research process. As Scientific Objectivity's biggest fan, Dr. Gears couldn't agree more. So as he settled in for the day's round of tests, he intended to keep a watchful eye on things and ensure that no funny business would take place. He didn't have much reason for concern, as his colleague Dr. Bonita prepped her research materials. She was working with two items, a small replica of Michelangelo's sculpture of David and a sealed envelope containing something that was to be handled with extreme caution, a photograph of SCP-096's face. She planned to place the items inside on the very fine setting, in an attempt to see what result might be produced from combining an ideal of traditional beauty standards with the image of a creature that felt such profound shame and distress as its own appearance that it would destroy anyone who looked at its face. Like any good scientist, Dr. Bonita wanted to remove any unnecessary variables from her experiment. So as she placed her items inside the intake booth, she slowly, delicately unsealed the envelope. She wanted to put the picture inside by itself, 
without the extra element of the envelope, potentially complicating things. Unfortunately, like Marie Curie slowly, unintentionally poisoning herself with her own research materials, she didn't truly understand the danger of what she held in her hands. Just as she was setting the photograph down, her eyes flickered to the image. Before she could stop herself, before she could even look away or squeeze her eyes shut, she caught a glimpse of the one thing she should never look at. SCP-096's face. She gasped and slammed the photograph down, but she knew it was too late. The sound of an inhuman shriek coming from across the facility signaled that she was right. It was coming for her, and nothing in the world could stop it. In a containment cell on the other side of the facility, Foundation staff were horrified as they heard the telltale scream of an enraged SCP-096. The pale, thin creature, once huddled in the corner silently, had stretched to its full height of 2.38 meters and was screaming, sobbing, wailing, and gibberish, and beginning to tear its way out of its chamber. Guards tried their best to subdue the entity, firing their weapons at it, but the bullets did nothing to damage the creature's pale flesh or stop its movements. It ripped through the steel cube that contained it and knocked the guards out of its way with one swipe of its unnaturally long arms, sending them careening into a nearby wall. Fortunately for them, SCP-096 only knocked them unconscious. It didn't stop to harm them further, as it had a more important goal in mind. Find the person who had seen its face and destroy them. As the alarm blared, signifying a high threat level containment breach, SCP-096 loped down the hall toward Dr. Bonita in SCP-914's room. Dr. Gears had not spotted Dr. Bonita's grave mistake and had no idea what had triggered the alarm he was hearing. He stepped away from the observation window, turning his attention to the crisis that was clearly happening somewhere else in the facility. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was panicking. She saw her life flash before her eyes, the certainty of impending doom that was coming for her and coming fast all because of one brief error in judgment. What could she do? There was nowhere to hide, no way she could run away fast enough, unless if she managed to lure 096 into the intake booth and start the machine while the creature was inside, maybe it would transform into something less intent on tearing her limb from limb. It was a risky move, and one that could jeopardize her position at the Foundation, but she couldn't very well keep her job if she was dead, so it seemed like it just might be worth a shot. A primal roar of agony and fury interrupted her thoughts, and she knew that SCP-096 was moments away from breaking down the door and getting its hands on her. She would have to move fast. With a screeching grind of metal on metal, SCP-096 wrenched the door off its hinges and barreled into the room in its search for the person who had seen its face. It ran toward the silhouette of Dr. Bonita standing just at the entrance to the intake booth. She tucked and rolled out of the way just as the monster entered the booth. The door automatically slid shut behind it, and as SCP-096 rattled the door and tried to free itself, she turned the knob to very fine with every ounce of strength and speed she had. There was a ding of a small bell, and the machine whirred to life as the objects inside were refined. Dr. Bonita had no idea what would be waiting for her in the output booth, but she could only hope that her last-ditch effort had managed to save her life. In the fog of panic, she briefly felt an itch of scientific curiosity, too. What would become of a being like SCP-096 in a machine as strange and wonderful as SCP-914? What would the addition of the statue do to it? As the door to the outtake booth slid open, steam poured out. It appeared her questions would soon be answered. Cautiously, in spite of herself, Dr. Bonita called out, Hello? No one answered, but she heard the sound of footsteps, slow and careful, as a figure emerged from the mist. She covered her mouth in shock, her eyes wide. Dear God, she whispered in awe. Standing in front of her with pale, smooth skin and the same imposing stature was the most beautiful man she had ever seen. Wide, dark eyes shone under thick, sculpted eyebrows. Under the eyes, an aquiline nose, full pouty lips, a strong, sharp jawline. His head was topped with a tangle of lustrous dark curls. It was the kind of hair she had only seen flowing in the wind on the covers of the romance novels she wanted desperately to buy, but was too embarrassed to be seen purchasing. His physique was, well, statuesque. 
like the build of the very Michelangelo sculpture she had placed into the machine just moments ago. There was no other way to say it. He was handsome, despite still being a little lanky and nine feet tall. He peered at her curiously, towering over her in a way that had been terrifying in his former shape, but now made her heart skip a beat in an entirely different way. Hi, was all she could think to say. Was she blushing? She shook her head, snapping herself out of it. She was a scientist, damn it, not some giddy schoolgirl passing notes in class. This was an incredible achievement, something she would need to study thoroughly, and she very much wanted to study him thoroughly. No, no time for that. She needed to write up a report, to inform her superiors, to try her best not to lose her job over this. She had to remain professional. Hi. The man that had once been, or perhaps still was, as CP-096 spoke. Oh, you, you can talk! Dr. Bonita laughed in surprise. The man's brow furrowed. His newfound ability to speak was a surprise to him too, it seemed. Yes, I can. What happened to me? He asked, stumbling over his words slightly, getting used to the feeling of them. You ran into the machine, she gestured to SCP-914. I'm not exactly sure, to be honest, but you're very different now. He nodded. I feel different. I feel calm. He sighed, the relief playing on his face before a shadow of sadness fell over him. I don't think I have to hurt anymore. I, I'm sorry for what I did before. Dr. Bonita did not know what to say. How do you respond when something you've been studying from afar, been horrified and fascinated by an equal measure, looks at you with a new, beautiful face and apologizes for all the harm it caused? This whole experience was so surreal that she might think she was dreaming if she didn't work at a place that was one long waking dream, or nightmare, depending on the day. Uh, Dr. Bonita, there's been a containment breach. Are you all right? Dr. Gears had returned to the room, taking in the sight of the destruction left in 096's way. I'm fine, she called to him, and he followed her voice into the room, then stopped at the sight of the transformed anomaly. Hmm. I don't have time for whatever this is. I trust you'll handle it. Dr. Gears took a long sip of his coffee, and taking Bonita's shock silence as confirmation, had a leisurely stroll back to his office. A few moments later, the guards responsible for containing SCP-096 arrived on the scene, expecting to see carnage and find a docile SCP-096 crouched over a lifeless body, but instead, they found the same truly bizarre sight that Dr. Gears had shrugged off, and Dr. Bonita was still doing her best to process. They entered the room with their weapons drawn, but quickly lowered them, scratching their heads in confusion instead before radioing their superiors and asking for further instructions. Responses from various Foundation staff who caught a glimpse of SCP-096's bold new look included, Oh, would you look at that? Who's that guy? He's what? And in the words of Dr. Jack Bright, Oh no, he's hot! <laughs> Dr. Bright also proposed making the new SCP-096 a TikTok account and YouTube channel, seeking modeling representation for him, or selling a novelty calendar filled with pictures of 096 in various costumes. These would be, in his words, quote, excellent ways to increase revenue for the Foundation. So, really, you're the weird ones now for thinking my ideas are weird. Dr. Bright was asked to leave SCP-096 alone and stop trying to take his headshot. In the days that followed the incident with SCP-914, the SCP Foundation was at a loss about what to do with this new, seemingly harmless version of SCP-096. Dozens of D-Class were brought in to look at his face and see if the entity would still enter one of his rage states after a few days of getting used to his new form, but he never did. No screaming, no swallowing people whole, nothing more than a polite, if somewhat shy greeting and a courteous, how are you doing today? The D-Classes were relieved, but confused about being pulled from their cells just to stare at some random handsome man. Dr. Clef suggested dissecting SCP-096 to see what his new body looked like on the inside. This request was denied. Several interviews were conducted to evaluate SCP-096's mental and emotional state. Now that the anomaly was capable of coherent speech, it was much simpler to evaluate the potential threat level he might pose. Every researcher who spoke with him came to the same conclusion. Gone was the danger of the old SCP-096. He had not just become beautiful in a classical, superficial sense, but he had become beautiful on the inside as well. Interviewers reported a warm, friendly demeanor, a talent for engaging in conversation once he was made to feel comfortable, 
and a sincere interest in the thoughts, opinions, and feelings of those he spoke with. There was only one thing left to do, to make sure that SCP-096 had really changed from something deadly to something almost resembling an ordinary person. A photograph of SCP-096's face, of its original face, was removed from a secure vault by a D-Class. Then, the D-Class was sent into a room with SCP-096 and instructed to place the photograph on the table. SCP-096 looked down at what had once been his face, and his eyes filled with tears. A soft, broken sob <laughs> left his lips, and he wrapped his arms around himself, hunching over as if in physical pain. Outside the room, guards prepared to handle things if 096 began to attack. Instead, he wiped his tears, took a deep, shuddering breath, and looked at the D-Class with a somber expression. He picked up the photograph on the table and tore it in half, as he finally summoned the strength to speak. Please, get rid of these. That is not who I am anymore. At Dr. Bonita's strong insistence, backed up by the conclusions of the research staff who interviewed SCP-096, a reevaluation of the entity's containment measure was ordered. It seemed cruel and unnecessary waste of resources to keep 096 trapped in a steel cube in its current form. He would be moved to a standard humanoid containment cell and treated as well as other safe class anomalies provided with books, films, food, and drink upon request, and, of course, other comforts. Of course, the O5 Council insisted on evaluating the entity before any of these changes could be approved. Dressed in a specially tailored suit provided by Dr. Bonita, SCP-096 appeared before the Council to present his case. I know that I might not have the best record at the Foundation. I've done a lot of damage over the years, though, let's be honest, you all aren't exactly innocent either. Sorry, that was an attempt at a joke. I'm still very new to talking. All I can say is please consider giving me another chance to make a real life here, to make this place my home. Thank you for your time. What SCP-096 didn't know is that the O5 Council was so flabbergasted by the sight of his new face that they didn't retain a single word he said. They had all given their official approval before he even finished his short presentation. Before long, SCP-096 was moved out of his steel cube and into a new containment chamber that resembled a mid-range studio apartment, complete with a bed, a kitchenette, a television, and a table and chairs. He was provided access to all major streaming platforms, as well as a large stack of books to help him develop his grasp of culture and language after so very long being isolated from human society. Though he wasn't exactly human, he was determined to act like it. Word quickly spread around the Foundation site, and humans and anomalies alike flocked to SCP-096's new home to visit him and see the miraculous transformation for themselves. SCP-999 was the first to come and see the new and improved 096, chirping excitedly as it oozed into his room. He pet the slime gently, his face breaking into a warm smile as its euphoric effect washed over him. The slime became so excited at meeting this new friend, someone it had known as a source of sadness and hurt for so long, that it tackled him to the ground and tickled him for several minutes. 096 laughing uproariously all the while, SCP-343 stopped by to give 096 his blessing and wish him well in this new chapter of life. A few days later, SCP-507 popped back into the site and wanted to see the changes for himself. He was thoroughly impressed, though privately confessed to missing 096's more monstrous form, which reminded him of some of his favorite cryptids. There was one anomaly that was not thrilled with the appearance of SCP-096, however. SCP-056 was furious upon hearing about the new beautiful man that everyone just couldn't shut up about. It demanded a chance to speak to SCP-096 and to tell him that this place isn't big enough for the both of us. I'm the fairest one of all, you sniveling little worm. But the request was denied. SCP-056 sulked about it for several weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Bonita was still intent on getting to know SCP-096 better. During previous testing with SCP-978, the desire camera, a photo taken of SCP-096 revealed that his greatest desire was to disappear. Curious about the results would be now, Dr. Bonita received permission to take another picture of SCP-096. She snapped the photo while 096 was sitting in a chair in his new containment chamber, looking directly at the camera. When the photo developed, the result was simple. Everything in the picture was exactly the same with one exception. Dr. Bonita was pictured sitting next to 096, her hand clasped in his, 
both were smiling soft, contented smiles. When she showed him the photograph, he smiled at her and shook his head. It really is an amazing camera. She flushed. Doctor, before you go, could I ask your name? Dr. Bonita smiled and nodded. It's Isabel. What should I call you? SCP-096 paused thoughtfully for a moment. He was giving himself a name for the very first time, allowing himself an identity other than a strange, hollow, pale thing that existed to cry and suffer and hurt. Finally, he answered her, call me David. Down in the depths of Facility 23, a group of scientists stand before a massive, rumbling piece of machinery. They all hold their breath as the gigantic mechanism suddenly stops. It's eerily quiet for a moment before a door slides open. The scientists crane their necks to see inside, to see what the result of their great experiment was. These were some of the greatest minds in the SCP Foundation, but nothing could prepare them for what they had created. September 9th, 2008 was an unseasonably frosty day when Dr. Charles Gears, one of the SCP Foundation's most iconic scientists, parked his Honda Civic outside of what seemed like an innocuous government cold storage warehouse. He sipped his coffee and surveyed the building, which he, along with about a hundred others in total, knew to be Site-19, Facility-23. Why was Dr. Gears, former director of all Euclid-level containment at Site-19, here today? Because official testing was about to begin on SCP-914. The Foundation had acquired the machine now known as SCP-914 some time ago, but only after its recent reclassification to 914 had it been relocated to Facility 23. It must have been important because the entirety of the facility was being repurposed for SCP-914 research. They were dealing with an immensely complicated piece of anomalous technology here, and the same question was on everybody's lips. What exactly does this thing do? Dr. Arthur Hackett, the facility director, had requested the cold, clinical assistance of Dr. Gears in providing the answer. Once he'd finished his morning coffee, Dr. Gears headed inside. The facility's security chief, Agent Alan Sedna, had been beefing up security at the building, and at least two mobile task force units were already on call in case anything happened. The first day of official testing is always a crapshoot. You might get a nice drink out of it, like with SCP-294, or you may get an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. You never really know. All Dr. Gears knew, as he walked up the granite steps to the main entrance, was that he was already feeling exhausted. When you've dealt with anomalous objects and entities for decades on end, the sense of wonder and mystery begins to wear off, only to be replaced with a kind of tedium any office worker knows all too well. Everyone knew that Dr. Gears was devoted to the job, perhaps more than anyone else, but he approached the job with an emotionless effect. You wouldn't know from looking at him if he was thinking about the deadly anomalous creature in the next room, or what he was going to have for lunch that day. The doctor passed through security and was briefed in the break room by Dr. Lucius Veritas, director of research at Site-19. He explained that the machine seemed to work in the absence of any power source, its mechanical structure is similar to machinery from the Industrial Revolution, but it's exceedingly complex for something constructed in that time. Foundation analyses into the structure of the 914 machine have shown it to have as many as 8 million moving parts, and that might even be an incomplete estimate. Dr. Gears wore his trademark blank face as he listened, solemnly nodded, and asked to be shown the anomaly. He was led into Containment Chamber 109B by a pair of guards. According to all current Foundation tests, the machine doesn't appear to pose any active risk of containment breach or danger to the guards, earning it the rare safe designation. As a result, aside from guards stationed on site, containment procedures for 914 were minimal. Whether this designation would need to be changed after testing was something Dr. Gears would soon find out. SCP-914 was a truly impressive sight to behold, a giant clockwork mechanism taking up around 18 square feet with an unfathomably complex combination of screwdrives, belts, pulleys, springs, and gears. A less stoic researcher might see the humor in recruiting a Dr. Gears to test such a device, but comedy definitely wasn't one of Dr. Gears' specialties. He stared at the machine with a detached fascination, analyzing its vital components at a glance. Gears noted a large mainspring beneath a rudimentary selection panel. The panel is copper, with a large selection knob fixed to an arrow above a series of different options. Rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, and very fine. There was also a large key below the selection panel, 
for the purposes of winding up the mainspring and initiating whatever procedure this machine was designed to enact. Next, Dr. Gears noticed two large booths connected to the machine by a pair of equally large copper tubes. The booth on the left labeled intake, and the right labeled output. Incredibly, Dr. Gears was able to immediately deduce the purpose of this machine. It was designed to enact some kind of transformative process on whatever was placed into the intake booth. But what kind of transformative process? That's exactly what Dr. Gears was here to find out. The experiment was simple. They would gather a series of samples, both inanimate objects and living tissue, and use them to explore the different permutations of the 914 machine's transformative abilities. This initial series of experiments were approved by O5 Command and the Site Director, and with the 47 researchers present in Facility 23 at his disposal, Dr. Gears commenced his research into SCP-914. To minimize risk, Dr. Gears decided the first test would be a simple kilogram of steel. On his orders, the steel was placed into the intake booth. With the doctor's approval, a junior researcher set the control panel setting to rough and began twisting the mainspring key, at which point the booth's doors closed and a small bell inside chimed. The machine began to rumble, its eight million working pieces churning into life. It continued like this for around 10 minutes before falling silent, at which point the output booth opened. What had once been a single lump of steel weighing one kilogram was now an uneven pile of smaller lumps with evidence of laser cutting. Dr. Gears may note of the fact that having lasers within such a machine is both anachronistic and anomalous, and that the rough setting appears to messily cleave the object placed within the intake booth into pieces. Dr. Gears also noted that it would be unwise to test any kind of explosive material on the rough setting, unless, of course, they wanted to destroy the building. The research continued. Dr. Gears used another one kilogram lump of steel to test the one-to-one -one feature. This time, the result was far more peculiar. The output booth contained the exact same weight in steel screws. This result was sparking even greater connections in Dr. Gears' impressive analytical mind. Firstly, the one-to-one -one feature caused the 914 machine to transform the output into something different from, but similar to, the intake. And while this would require further testing, it appeared that the 914 machine, despite being anomalous, does still follow the laws of physics. Samples passed through the machine conserved their mass and would not be transmuted on an atomic level from one element to another. Next, Dr. Gears pushed another lump of steel through the machine on the fine setting. The result this time was a kilogram of steel carpet tacks. From this, Dr. Gears was able to ascertain that the fine feature improves the samples placed within the intake booth somewhat. However, things got even stranger when Gears performed the same experiment on the very fine setting. The output booth provided several unknown gases and a lump of unknown metal with anomalous qualities. Namely, it was resistant to heat up to 50,000 degrees, impossible to bend or break with any force, and was a perfect conductor of electricity. Dr. Gears suddenly realized his task here may be more interesting than he'd initially imagined. Was that a bit of a smile on his face that one researcher spotted? Surely not. This was the famous unflappable Dr. Gears, after all. The doctor decided to take it up a notch and began to test more complex items in the 914 machine. He removed his own wristwatch and placed it into the input booth before setting the machine to course and letting her rip. Literally, in this case. When the output booth was opened, the watch had been painstakingly disassembled into its component parts, with no damage to said parts. Dr. Gears noted the coarse feature as a more mild version of the rough, in the sense that it was able to take an object apart without any kind of fundamental damage. He also made note of the fact he'd need to get himself a new watch. Dr. Gears then asked one of the researchers to surrender their cell phone for testing. While none were excited at the prospect of their phone getting eviscerated by a clockwork behemoth, one of the researchers eventually surrendered their BlackBerry curve to the doctor. He placed it into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting, and 10 minutes later, the output booth released a brand new Apple iPhone. Sadly for the researcher who donated his BlackBerry, he wasn't allowed to keep the new device. Naturally, Dr. Gears was interested in trying out the anomalous, very fine setting on a more complex object. Seeing as no other researchers were eager to hand over their personal effects, he took a Colt Python revolver from a member of security and ran that through the machine on very fine. 
The result was an extremely powerful energy weapon containing gamma radiation, which fired a beam capable of disintegrating anything in its path. While the weapon's power was immense, it was also too dangerous and unstable to be added to the Foundation's armory for general use. Having collected a wealth of data from more complex objects, Dr. Gears was eager to move to the next stage, live test subjects. While his fellow researchers had some reservations, the experiments pushed on, beginning with mice. A single white mouse was put into the intake booth on the one-to-one -one setting and the machine was activated. The result five minutes later was an almost identical creature, save for the fact that it now had brown fur. Encouraged by the fact that the mouse survived the refinery process, Dr. Gears next applied for the use of two chimps in his SCP-914 experiments. The first chimp was run through the machine on the fine setting. The result was a chimp of human-level intelligence, who has since begun working for the Foundation under the alias Dr. Bobo, and the data from this test has been expunged from the official reports to protect Dr. Bobo's privacy. The second primate test, this time on Ruff, was not quite as positive. The chimp was dismembered, with the mutilated corpse showing evidence of cutting from high heat and crushing. Of course, everyone knew where these tests were eventually going. Dr. Gears requested two members of D-Class personnel for testing. The first was a 42-year-old Caucasian male weighing 108 kilograms and standing 185 centimeters tall. Dr. Gears ran him through SCP-914 on the one-to-one -one setting, resulting in a slightly taller Hispanic man with a slightly lower body weight. He immediately became severely confused and agitated and attempted to attack the guards present, leading to his unfortunate termination by Foundation staff. It was on the final live test that tragedy truly struck. A 28-year-old Caucasian male was run through the machine on the highly anomalous, very fine setting. The result was an utterly nightmarish creature. So horrifying that the majority of the details on its physical appearance have been expunged from the report. The creature made a sudden escape, breaching the relatively minor containment procedures intended for the inert SCP-914. This highly dangerous creature killed eight guards, as well as two senior researchers upon emerging from the output booth. A special response team was dispatched to take the creature down, but that proved harder than expected. SCP-914 had massively improved upon the human original, especially when it came to its killing ability. Eventually, it was captured, but the special response team suffered injuries and memory loss as a result of the creature's anomalous powers. The creature was also severely wounded, and its blood caused corrosive damage to the plumbing in Facility 23. The creature expired from its injuries several hours later, turning into a cloud of blue ash that blinded a nearby research team. Dr. Gears would later comment that the experiments were ultimately still a success, in spite of some minor hiccups. Testing on the device continues to this day in an effort to understand the full potential of the machine. Though, for obvious reasons, biological testing on the machine has since been forbidden without direct authorization from O5 Command. After all, if an already dangerous SCP was ever subjected to the very fine transformation setting, we could be dealing with something beyond our greatest nightmares. Dr. Gears was having another boring day at the SCP Foundation, and that was exactly how he liked it. He treated himself to a cup of decaf black coffee, no cream, no sugar, a simple plain donut, and an apple. The breakfast of champions, to him at least. His duties today were ones he'd overseen so many times before. Watching his ever-rotating legion of subordinates shove various items into SCP-914 the Clockworks, just to see what on earth would happen. This machine had the ability to transmute matter in a variety of fashions, depending on the input selection, whether rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or even very fine. They tested everything, from Dr. Gears' watch to a chimp, which, as we all know, resulted in the beloved hyper-intelligent chimp scientist, Dr. Bobo. There were in fact such extensive testing records for SCP-914 that Dr. Gears had started taking an uncharacteristic hands-off approach to testing. As long as the researchers working under him were reasonably sure that the results of their testing wouldn't result in a containment breach, a fundamental alteration of consensus reality, or some massive loss of life, they could just go ahead with whatever dumb little experiment their heart desired. This, however, would turn out to be a way longer leash than Dr. Gears ever should have given to the kind of weirdos who work at the SCP Foundation. There had been certain, let's say, 
incidents in the past that have proved members of the SCP Foundation aren't above using anomalies inappropriately for their own personal enjoyment. There was, of course, the incident with SCP-662, the butler's handbell, and the supernatural butler it summons Mr. Deeds. During the early stages of testing, Dr. Mirth, under the guise of experimentation, made Mr. Deeds make him tea, wash his car, cut his hair, and even do his laundry. Dr. Mirth was given a stern talking to by the O5 Council for this abuse of power. Good job, O5 Council. It's not like you ever use anomalies for your own benefit. Um, <clears throat> let's move on. Nothing to see here, folks. Speaking of people working for the Foundation using anomalies inappropriately, who could forget the extremely uncomfortable incident involving SCP-137, a real toy? This anomaly has the ability to become a real-life version of any toy brought into its vicinity, from the Masters of the Universe to Barbie in her dream house. But one researcher was hiding a horrifying secret. He was a brony. And that's why he sneaked a Twilight Sparkle toy into the testing chamber so he could have a conversation with his favorite My Little Pony character, which all in attendance agreed just had incredibly rancid vibes through and through. And that brings us back to today. Dr. Gears deciding to let his subordinate researchers throw pretty much anything into the clockworks as long as it was unlikely to cause physical harm. And leaving this metaphorical door open allowed people like Dr. Siegel to step through. You see, while Dr. Siegel was considered by most to be an incredibly diligent and hardworking junior researcher, he did have one vice in his downtime. He was a card-carrying furry. And we're not just talking about a guy who watched Disney's Zootopia a few too many times. He had his own... <sighs> fursona. A wolf, if you were curious. I personally wasn't. He attended cons for fellow furries semi-frequently, and even had his own expensive, custom, high-end fursuit. As such, there was one SCP he found particularly interesting. SCP-1471, also known as Mal-O, version 1.0.0 an anomalous mobile app with some extremely strange properties. If you access it on an app store of your choice, you'll encounter an image of a strange skull-headed canine creature with the following iconic description. Mal-O, version 1.0.0, free, reviews, zero. Description, never settle for those awkward feelings of being alone ever again. Mal-O is an exciting and interactive experience that will keep you engaged and intrigued. The anxiety of social situations can be nerve-wracking, but after just a few hours of Mal-O, you will soon forget all about those painful emotions of disappointment. Be part of the new craze that is so quickly becoming the next social substitute. Remember, the more you participate, the more Mal-O will engage you. Your experience is completely up to you. Absolutely no ads. Enjoy. Dr. Siegel was certainly eager to forget all his painful emotions of disappointment and embrace the new social substitute, but he'd read all the documents and seen all the pictures on the file. Those who download the Mal-O app will be texted a series of photos, becoming closer to home over time, both literally and figuratively, which show the strange creature known as Mal-O getting closer and closer. For some, this would be a complete nightmare. For those inclined in the direction of Dr. Siegel, it would be a dream come true. There was only one issue. They were just pictures. But Dr. Siegel didn't get a job at the SCP Foundation by having a lack of intelligence. He very quickly figured out a potential solution to the digital barrier between him and his canine crush. He'd buy a burner phone, download the Mal-O app onto it, and put the resulting infected device directly into the clockworks. It was one of the best ideas he'd ever had, in his own humble opinion. But of course, it would all be about selecting the right setting. On rough, the most likely result would be the phone itself just being transformed into a pile of broken glass, metal, and a variety of conflict minerals reduced to dust. On course, the result would likely be the metal chassis of the phone, the front glass panel, and a neatly arranged interior gutted from within. On one-to-one, -one, considering he'd bought a slightly older, cheaper model of Samsung's smartphone, he'd probably get the Mal-O app on an iPhone. And on Fine, perhaps the best he could hope for was getting Mal-O version 2.0.0, which may have some minor improvement, like the pictures appearing twice as fast as they would with the normal app experience. 
Dr. Siegel knew that the only other option that could potentially bring Mal O into the real world was the highly unpredictable, very fine option, which would either produce the desired result or cause something utterly horrifying to happen. But at the end of the day, Dr. Siegel thought to himself, isn't anything worth having also worth incurring a little risk? Who dares wins after all, right? He downloaded the fateful app and made his way into the testing area for SCP-914. He'd booked the slot, so it was all official, but he still felt his heart racing as he put the infected phone into the input chamber. He set the control panel to very fine, exactly as planned, and activated the machine. Cogs twisted and churned, engines rumbled and sputtered, pipes wriggled and hissed. It was clear that something was going on here. When the process was complete and the output chamber opened with a billowing carpet of steam, Dr. Siegel could barely contain his excitement. He hoped that Mal-O would come strolling out of the smoke like Darth Vader in Star Wars A New Hope, so you can only imagine his extreme disappointment when the chamber was completely empty. It didn't make sense. He thought everything through. How could the result possibly be so anticlimactic? This had gone from one of the most exciting days of his life to the most depressing. Dr. Siegel sighed and decided to call it quits, heading out of the test chamber, having no idea what he'd just unleashed onto the Foundation. Across the site, Dr. Alto Clef, one of the Foundation's most infamous researchers, was polishing his favorite shotgun in his office. He was whistling a cheerful tune to himself, just loving life, when he heard some strange rustling by the door. He turned around on his swivel chair just to make sure it wasn't Dr. Bright putting another bucket of battery acid on top of his door as a, quote, fun, harmless prank. Instead, he was shocked to see Mal O, an actual, physical Mal O, standing in his doorway, grinning. For a moment, Clef was too shocked to even react. This didn't make any kind of sense, but when Mal O gave him a cheeky wink, he immediately loaded his shotgun and fired, blowing away a chunk of his own doorway. But sadly for him, by that time, Mal O had already darted away, intent on causing mischief elsewhere. It's favorite pastime. Dr. Clef was still wondering whether that rascal Dr. Bright was somehow behind this fiasco. But he was not, because he was actually about to become Mal O's next victim in its ruthless reign of mild to moderate inconvenience. Dr. Bright was swanning around the break room with his favorite morning snack, a coffee with extra cream and a Danish from his favorite bakery in town. He was looking forward to enjoying these two simple pleasures in his otherwise incredibly stressful life, but little did the poor doctor know tragedy was about to strike, and nothing would ever be the same. Just as the immortal doctor was about to disembark from the room, Mal O appeared right in front of him, giving him the mild shock of his life. It was such a surprising occurrence, in fact, that he momentarily lost his grip on his coffee mug and his Danish, causing both to tumble to the ground. The mug shattered and the Danish splattered. By the time Dr. Bright looked up, Mal O was already gone, just like his breakfast snack. Dr. Bright fell to his knees and screamed, Why? up to an indifferent break room ceiling. But Mal O was just getting started. Dr. Kane Pathos Crow was on his way from his kennel, <clears throat> we mean his private quarters, to the soul extractor, when Mal O suddenly manifested in front of him. This resulted in a brief barking match between the two for dominance over that particular hallway, which ended in Mal O demanifesting to bother someone else which technically made Dr. Crow the winner, though Crow himself resented ever being forced to act like a mere mutt. How, he began to wonder, had Mal O escaped its app and begun to harass the real world? This would warrant further investigation. Mal O continued its rampage of irritation across the site, intended to leave no stone of frustration unturned. And it wasn't just the Foundation staff it intended to freak out. It was just as eager to go and bother its fellow anomalies now that it had access to the meat space. Yes, that is a real term, we're not just being weird and gross, we promise. Over in the cell of SCP-173 The Sculpture, three members of D-Class personnel were cleaning up the homicidal creature's blood and poop. They were engaged in the standard procedure. One of them mopped, while the other two kept a close eye on SCP-173 to keep it frozen in place. That's when Mal O popped into the cell behind them for a split second before disappearing, scaring the living hell out of all three of them. Though the fright was, of course, secondary to the fact that the second they looked away, SCP-173 snapped all three of their necks. Oops. 
may have gone a little too far on that one, eh, Mallow? But this newly embodied burdensome beast was just getting started, friends. No anomaly was safe from its new antics. Next, it appeared in front of SCP-682's acid tank and made rude faces at the hateful creature from the other side of the glass. This only served to sour the creature's already utterly horrific mood. It thrashed around in the chamber, attempting to get out and perform an act of great violence. But by that time, Mal O was already long gone, and SCP-682 was left grumbling in immense frustration. SCP-049 the Plague Doctor was having another very boring day. He'd been denied his animal cadaver test subjects for several days as a disciplinary measure after the latest incident, and as such, he was finding other ways to pass the time. Today, he was meticulously removing each piece of medical equipment, polishing them, and putting them in a neat line on his desk in his containment chamber. Scalpels, forceps, speculums, bone saws, all wonderful, shiny, and pristine. The plague doctor found it to be an incredibly calming activity, so, of course, Mal O couldn't just let him be. The cantankerous canine, driven mad by the power of suddenly being able to interact with the world physically, manifested in the middle of the containment chamber and used its tail to knock all the meticulously arranged medical equipment onto the ground with a thunderous clatter. The plague doctor, devastated, lifted both of his hands to his beak and yelled, Sacre bleu! in horror. In that same instant, Mal O once again disappeared, leaving the tragic doctor to start from scratch. It was a serious setback on an otherwise lovely day. Curse you strange dog creature, he thought to himself while bending over to pick up the pieces. Curse you and your entire bloodline. A group of hardcore mobile task force members was engaged in the comically manly activity of playing poker while smoking in the barracks. And before you judge them for that, remember that if your job was as stressful as being a member of a mobile task force, you'd probably smoke too. But their job was about to get a little more stressful when Mal O suddenly materialized and gave the poker table a sharp kick, sending the towers of poker chips and decks of cards all over the place before disappearing without a trace yet again. It completely ruined their game. One of the more junior members asked, Should we have, uh, done something about that? A more senior operative shook his head and said, Well, uh, we'll do something when we get the official call from up top. Until then, uh, let's reshuffle the deck. In the Site-19 cafeteria, Dr. Agatha Wrights was preparing to eat a delicious salad that she'd been waiting all day to enjoy. As we've often established, working at the SCP Foundation can be an immensely stressful job, so you need to take the small joys where you can get them. For Dr. Wrights, this delicious premium salad that she'd bought from Harris Teeter earlier in that day was indeed a joy. She even got a fancy vinaigrette dressing for the occasion. Before she took the first bite, she noticed SCP-073 Kane approaching. Dr. Wright smiled and gave him a polite nod. Kane waved back. That, our dear viewers, is when tragedy struck. Mal O suddenly manifested in front of Kane, propping out one of its canid legs right in front of where the hapless anomaly was walking. By the time Kane began to trip and fall over, Mal O had already vanished, but it was too late. Kane kept falling forward until one of his metal hands landed right into the bowl that contained Dr. Wright's salad. Due to his anomalous abilities, the salad immediately withered away into nasty, dead nothingness. Dr. Wright's began to cry as Kane, who felt profoundly guilty, tried his best to apologize. Truly, nobody in Site-19 was safe. Mal O popped up behind Iris and ruined all of her photos. Mal O popped up behind the immortal Hitler clone in his cell and gave him a good kick in the rear. Mal O even popped up right behind SCP-343, also known as God, who smugly replied, I knew you were going to do that, my son. Needless to say, it had been one hell of a day. Dr. Siegel, completely ignorant to the chaos his actions had caused around the site, had cried in the bathroom for 40 minutes out of sheer disappointment. He'd barely been able to focus on the rest of his duties for the day on account of being severely bummed out. This was a day he'd been looking forward to for so long, and it all had been for nothing. That evening, he was driving home on the highway, listening to sad songs on the radio, thinking about the fact he'd probably just crack open a beer and get some sleep when he got home. He sighed again and looked up to adjust his rearview mirror when he saw a skeletal face with huge white eyes staring at him in the reflection. A quick, almost reflexive turn revealed a huge black figure with a canine skull for a face was indeed just sitting in his back seat, watching him. 
It was so shocking that he immediately veered off the road and crashed his car into the concrete divider in the middle of the road, breaking his nose and collarbone in the process. Really a perfect cherry on top for this kind of day. Dr. Siegel was sitting in the hospital not long after that, with a cast around his upper body. This was also where he received a bouquet of flowers from Dr. Gears with an attached note saying he was put on three-month disciplinary leave for the irresponsible use of SCP-914. Dr. Siegel looked up and saw that Mal O was peering around the corner at him with its dead white eyes, its fang-lined maw twisted into a permanent, ominous grin. At this point, Dr. Siegel realized that being chased around constantly by a demonic skull-faced anomaly in real life wasn't nearly as whimsical as he expected it would be. In hindsight, that probably should have been obvious, shouldn't it? Though, please, let us know if you'd like Mal O to stalk you in real life in the comments below, you bunch of weirdos. You know how it is. We put up a community post asking for our esteemed audience's opinion on a given anomalous topic, and when you give us the answers, we make a video like this, responding to them. It's a perfect system. It runs like clockwork. Or more specifically, like SCP-914, The Clockworks. A fascinating safe class anomaly that can transform anything placed inside one of its chambers in a number of exciting and sometimes terrifying ways. We asked you if the device was in your hands, how would you use it? And before we get into some of the great answers we selected, here's a quick refresher on how the machine works. When an object is placed, or entity is placed, into its first chamber, the user has the option to select one of five settings, each of which leads to a relatively predictable result. First, rough, which completely destroys the item, often utterly disintegrating it and turning it into dust. There is no way to repair such an item. Course is a little less severe. It dismantles the object rather than destroys, cleanly and efficiently breaking it into its component parts, often in a manner that would be conductive to the object's reconstruction. One-to-one -one is a setting that replaces the object or entity with something similar, usually in size, weight, or quality. Fine is a setting that improves the item within reasonable means, rarely straying into anomalous territory with these improvements. And the most mysterious and volatile setting of all is very fine which improves the item or entity in an unpredictable, anomalous manner, sometimes to disastrous results. Great, so now we're all caught up. We've handed you a great power. Now let's see if you can handle it with great responsibility. Sam Rosenthal said, I feel like it would be interesting to put a musical instrument like a piano through it on very fine. It would be interesting to see what the machine would consider to be an improvement with something so subjective. Edit, it would also need to be something very high-end, like a Steinway, ooh, good choice, so that it didn't just come out as a nicer piano. Putting a Steinway piano into the clockworks on the fine setting would likely result in an improvement, making it a finer instrument with a sweeter, richer sound, potentially also changing its model from a baby grand piano to a concert grand piano. However, putting it into the machine on the very fine setting would be more likely to make the piano come alive, turning its legs into limbs capable of functional locomotion, and as for its keys, they kinda already resemble teeth in a weird way, so we're going to say that's a no-brainer. Its keys are definitely turning into actual teeth that are dripping with deadly venom. Anyone else getting Super Mario 64 flashbacks, or is that just me? Isaac Ely said, If most of the chains binding SCP-2317 have snapped, then presumably there is remnants of the chains laying around. The Foundation could combine this material with regular chains and put it on very fine in SCP-914 to create new ones to restrain the devourer of worlds. Something that's extremely important to remember is that the results of a very fine transmutation are always unpredictable. Upgrading the chains may result in them literally gaining a mind of their own and trying to imprison the known universe. And if they do simply become better chains, Actually fixing them to the devourer becomes the next issue. Personally, you're welcome to take care of that one first. Eddie Ember said, So I had a crazy thought. I would put the substance produced by SCP-153, the soul extractor, through on one-to-one. -one. I'd be interested to see what the clockwork would quantify as the equivalent to a soul. I think it would be different depending on the personality of the soul inserted. Like while one person may give their soul for love, another one may give their soul for a chocolate bar. Well, if the scientifically dubious 1907 metaphysical experiments of Duncan McDougall are to be believed, souls, despite being ephemeral, weigh roughly 21 grams. If the clockworks have a difficult time qualitatively judging the value of a human soul, 
Perhaps it would provide a vaguely valuable item that weighs roughly 21 grams. Little heartless, sure, but what can you expect? It's all cogs, gears, and pulleys. Shane said, I would be interested in what would happen if you took a drawing of SCP-096 and put it on the one-to-one -one setting. Would it turn into a realistic photo? And if yes, then could this trigger the Shy Guy to attack you? I would also check this the other way around to see if you could get a pic of SCP-096 that doesn't activate his killing spree. While it's impossible to know for sure, we personally wouldn't risk this one. A single photon of SCP-096's face is enough to activate its rage state, as the failure of Dr. Dan's scramble goggles proved. So even if the clockwork produces an even half-decent true representation of 096, looking at it will give you a truly horrifying death sentence. Alec B. said, I would actually somehow get a part of SCP-682's body mass and experiment on it. Maybe downgrading the 682 piece by piece wouldn't let it combine together again, or maybe just upgrade, downgrade, or let some parts of 682 as they were. Maybe 682 wouldn't be able to adapt to this. Not a big chance, though. Anything involving SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile, is going to be unpredictable by the very nature of the cantankerous lizard itself. The big issue with trying to downgrade 682 piecemeal is that each part would be likely to reform and adapt before you had a chance to process the rest of it. X-Wing Knight said, What happens if you put one pill from SCP-500 on very fine? I would recommend against any more because there are not many, but maybe it would duplicate the pill because I don't know how you'd improve it as it already cures literally anything. Or maybe do it on rough to see if it gets broken down to its components and see if it can be reverse engineered. All we know for sure about SCP-500 and SCP-914 is that on the fine setting, it results in SCP-427, a locket with rejuvenating properties. The Foundation are reluctant to do any tests on SCP-500 given how valuable they are and how limited the supply is. But the very fine setting could result in something amazing. Maybe a doctor capable of curing anything. You know, the kind of doctor that SCP-049 wishes he was? Mr. Arthur said, It would be interesting to put the researcher that presents the SCPs on very fine. Maybe the machine will make the researcher into one of the writers of SCP-001, the database. It, hold, hold, hold on. You mean me? <laughs> you want to put me in that thing? Oh, you definitely don't want to put me in the machine at the very fine setting. We'd suddenly be capable of putting out a new video every few minutes. It'd destroy your timelines. And even if you unsubscribed, you'd still see the videos. <laughs> they just keep coming. There is no escape. SCP Explained is eternal. There is no escape! <clears throat> Moving on. Dr. Veronica said, Ah, it happened. My request to be hired as a doctor at the Foundation has been accepted. How about taking SCP-458, the never-ending pizza box, and putting it through on very fine? I imagine that it may be able to turn into something that can infinitely reproduce any food you desire. Failing that, maybe put a politician through on the very fine setting. Will that make them a very fine politician or a very fine person that happens to be a politician? Or will it make them Senator Armstrong from Metal Gear Rising? Ha, ah, pizzas and politicians, the two P's of conflicting emotions. Putting SCP-458 through SCP-914 might result in it turning into an entire pizzeria that gives away perfect pizzas at no cost. They'll have wonderful service, impeccable atmosphere, and always remember your name. They'll even give away free breadsticks and exquisite garlic bread bowls for the table, along with discounts on the finest mid-tier wine you've ever seen. It'd be divine. The politicians, on the other hand, could go in one of two ways. Maybe they'd become a true champion of the people, guided by ironclad principles that they'll fight tooth and nail to see actualized, doing right by their voters and the general public, treating their office with dignity and poise. Or they'll be the most incredible, silver-tongued, self-serving, conniving backstabber you've ever seen, endlessly devoted to winning office in order to monetize their position, raid the country's coffers, and run off with a fat bag of swag while the nation burns behind them. Oh wait, you said very fine? Chances are they can shoot lasers and are maybe 50 feet tall too. That's just kind of the thing you need to expect. Although the first descriptor sounded like a normal politician. George Simonovich said, If you put SCP-1609 through on the fine setting, maybe it would restore it to its chair form. That is a possibility. But given the anomalous nature of SCP-1609, the vengeful remains of a chair, it's equally possible that it might just become higher quality wood chips. Perhaps mm, mahogany? 
Ooh, that'd be real nice. Gustavo Abate said, If you put two or more things, would they fuse into one? If they do, would the machine separate them back if programmed right? I don't believe that SCP-914 would fuse multiple items or entities that are placed into its chamber. You may be confusing that with another anomalous technology, like, say, a teleporter. But if a researcher is willing to step into SCP-914 with a fly, then we might be able to see for ourselves whether we're right. Stupid people said, I think it would be interesting to put one of SCP-978's photos through the fine or very fine settings, preferably one with an interesting desire depicted, like the Shy Guy's desire to not exist. It's unlikely that even the clockworks would have the ability to tangibly change reality based on the photographs of the desire camera. However, on the very fine setting, the photo will, at the very least, begin to move and, heck, maybe something will even crawl out. That's when you'll really regret putting any photo of SCP-096 in there. The GC Gamer YT said, I would insert a cake or some other type of food on the very fine setting to see if it would come out as a better version of that food, like a cupcake into a full cake or better quality ingredients. Maybe it would simply change the flavor and we'd find out that there's some kind of sentience behind the clockworks allowing it to have an opinion on flavors. On the fine setting, everything you've just described is likely to be correct. On the very fine setting, on the other hand, the cake may grow giant spider legs, start spewing noxious amnestic fumes, and begin attacking anyone who isn't brave enough to eat it, and end its reign of delicious, well-frosted terror. Happy birthday. Moldy Doritos said, What about Y909 from SCP-3000 on Very Fine? Interesting to see an improved amnestic effect, or perhaps it changes the substance completely. Also interesting if you put it through on rough or very rough to see the output. Probably just a weak anesthetic or perhaps just rat poison. On Very Fine, the Y909 amnestic might become so powerful that just looking at it will induce a permanent Alzheimer's-like state in its victims, effectively deleting their minds. On rough, it may just break the vials it's stored in and spill the liquid everywhere. Dark Mega 5 said, I'd print out a meme, put it in on the fine setting, very fine might have unforeseen consequences, and post whatever comes out for massive amounts of Reddit karma. It is an honorable plan. We do it already in our own way. Whenever we finish a video, we run it through SCP-914 on fine just to make sure it's at top quality. And once we did it on very fine and, uh, We'll let you speculate as to what video that was down in the comments. Bredo said, I'm actually kind of interested to see what would happen if we put Keanu through the machine on very fine. Would it just break? <laughs> oh, Bredo, how can you improve on perfection? Solrex the Sun King said, Put my character sheet for D&D into it on very fine and just see what happens. Just uh, make sure the alignment is changed to neutral or better before doing so. On very fine, it's likely that SCP-914 would ignore the content of the paper and instead mutate the paper itself. Perhaps it would turn itself into a deadly paper plane, flying around and blasting little paper turrets and air-to-surface missiles at its targets. And that might veer a little more into chaotic evil territory. Devon underscore gaming said, I feel like putting in one of my model tanks to see how it looks in the very fine setting. It's unlikely that those model tanks would remain models for long. They may wind up full-sized, fully autonomous and chasing you down the Foundation halls, firing lasers and radioactive payloads. They might even receive air support from the paper plane. Riley Mushill said, What happens when you put water in and set it to very fine? Would it become water from the Fountain of Youth or would it become the best tasting water ever? On very fine, the water may become a nightmarish, aggressive creature that actively seeks out and destroys its human victims, like SCP-3280, also known as After the Storm. Though if we're extremely lucky, maybe life-giving anomalous water is in the cards. We just don't like to be overly optimistic these days. We've been burned too many times. Wild Knight Studios said, I would input the Tickle Monster in it and turn the setting to fine, allowing the Tickle Monster's power to make SCP-682 docile forever. While it's too much of a risk to ever try putting SCP-999 into 914, if things went well, 999 may become so powerful that we'd never experience sadness or anger on Earth again. And after everything we've been through, wouldn't that be a nice reprieve? Joey Rolf said, I would put in one of the O5 Council on very fine setting. 
Then they would make better choices because they're better than before. Don't let them know we said this, but personally, we don't think the members of the O5 Council should be getting any more anomalous superpowers. Aren't they ambiguously dangerous and powerful enough already? Dysfunctional Dragonborn said, I'd put an NFT into it on very fine in hopes it turns into something of value. <laughs> <laughs> you genuinely caught me by surprise there with that one. However, doing this might make their insidious power grow even stronger. Rather than worthless JPEGs, they might instead become a rival group, the NFT Foundation, which instead of protecting humanity from evil, instead decides to display a level of evil that rivals even the malice of the Scarlet King. It's really not worth finding out. Chosen Mosin said, I'd put my resume in, turn it to very fine, and see if I can eventually get hired in my college town. This is a high-risk, high-reward move. Putting your resume in on very fine may make it a document that immediately anomalously convinces potential employers that you would be the perfect candidate. It may push things further and make your prospective employers obsessed with you. They follow you home and watch you through your windows. They wish to take care of you. They wish to be wed to you. They will never leave you alone. After all, it was an excellent resume. Swagger said, I think putting Hideo Kojima in the very fine setting would show something very interesting. If you run Kojima through the clockworks on very fine, he might even be powerful enough to design and release Silent Hills on his own. No, we're still not over that. Is anyone? Hearth Fireheart said, A titanium prosthetic arm put in on very fine. Predicted result of possible prosthetic arm with anomalous properties, or an enhanced titanium prosthetic that can move exactly like a regular arm, while granting enhanced strength. We're always down for super-powered robot arms. Chances are on very fine it might even get shape-shifting or immensely powerful reality-warping abilities. So powerful it may even begin to change the rest of your body. Picture what happens to Tetsuo in Akira. Bunger said, Put a burger on the very fine setting. I'm very curious as to what would happen to something as simple as a burger. All we'll say is we definitely don't recommend eating the burger after you've run it through. It may wind up eating you from the inside once you're done. Dees said, I would put raw steak in the machine and put it on very fine. That way the steak will taste very delicious and be very fine. Mmm. <clears throat> I'm beginning to sense that people were just getting hungry when they started sending these ones in. And we definitely don't think you should put a stake into SCP-914. For all we know, it might turn into SCP-058 and get us all killed. Nicholas Lau said, Alright, this will sound disgusting. I toss in a jar of some of my own toenails, hair, dandruff, spit, and tears. Then cover the jar in lead paint, put on a sticker saying warning radioactive materials, and come in with a hazmat suit and a lead shield. Put on fine, then evacuate the room for the object to appear. Okay. Well, that's one of the most revolting answers we've ever received here on SCP Explained. Well done, Nicholas. It's going to be a while until we can get this thought out of our heads. This is the exact opposite of very fine. And the only person thrilled by this answer is my therapist. Ray Parentel said, A Nickelback CD on very fine. Just like we said for Keanu earlier, how could you improve on perfection? And there you have it, folks. Thanks again to everyone who sent in their fascinating and, um, disturbing answers. If you want to be in the next video like this, keep an eye on our community tab. And thank you for your continued support. You'll always be very fine to us. Panic had set in. Researchers were frantic. There was a buzz of activity, not born of excitement, but from sheer, widespread fear. The Scarlet King was coming. Nobody at the Foundation knew when or even how the monstrous multiversal tyrant would spring free and bring endless chaos with him, but everyone knew it would be soon. They'd all had the same warning, the same nightmare. In fact, it wasn't just the Foundation either. The entire world had shivered in their sleep, sharing in the bad dream of the destruction that was yet to come. The personnel of the SCP Foundation were on high alert. Of course, the organization had been aware of the impending threat of the Scarlet King for longer than almost anyone else, but that was part of the problem. Through some anomalous dream had by everyone on Earth, now everyone else knew. The Foundation was less interested in uncovering the source of the nightmare, and more trying to counteract its potential side effects. That was what potentially offered the Scarlet King the power he needed to enter into reality after all. 
The more people knew about him, tried to understand or to find the Eldritch Entity, the more power he was able to obtain. We have an army! One member of personnel chimed in during a frantic debate. We have an almost unlimited fighting force that are specially trained to handle anomalous threats, the MTF! Are you crazy? Another argued. The MTFs are certainly not unlimited. At any rate, the Scarlet King might be one of the most powerful beings in the entire multiverse. How can our troops, even our anomalous units, even hope to stand against that? You're proposing sending our people into a slaughter. Uh, they'd all be wiped out in a moment, one of the other researchers concurred. We need to be focusing our efforts on the amnestic rollout. If we can distribute enough to the population, we can wipe their collective memories of the dream from the other night. They'll forget, and that should slow the approach of the Scarlet King. Slow him, maybe, but it won't stop him, the first retorted. Full-scale retaliation is still our best option. Even now, while we try to come up with a strategy that could be enough to draw him in, we're willing him into existence as we speak. Uh, what about deploying another SCP? Came a voice from the edge of the group. It belonged to junior researcher Jake Harrison, a relatively new member of the Foundation who had been reading up on files related to the Scarlet King. He knew that in trying to understand and come up with a way to best the murderous multiversal warlord, that he was inadvertently feeding him power. But Jake seemed to have stumbled on the one solution that everyone else had overlooked. There was already another anomaly that might have been perfectly suited for defeating the Scarlet King. What do you suggest, Harrison? One of the other researchers spat. You really think something like 682 would be willing to work with us and destroy the Scarlet King? That's absurd. I heard 682 is meant to be one of the Scarlet King's children, another remarked. No, not 682, Jake argued, turning to the researcher that had just made a comment about the entity's supposed children, a group of anomalies that we believe to have been born of the Scarlet King himself. But you're on the right track. We use SCP-999. The group of researchers looked dumbfounded at Jake. He couldn't tell if they were about to yell at him or they would all burst out laughing. To his surprise, they actually looked to be considering his proposal. It was widely believed that SCP-999, the adorable blob of orange slime known as the Tickle Monster, was actually the final child of the Scarlet King. That's not entirely implausible, one of the researchers answered. SCP-999 is believed to be an ultimate force for good that could, in theory, defeat his father. Oh, the Scarlet King is meant to be unparalleled chaos. The two could cancel each other out, another theorized. But the Tickle Monster, sorry, SCP-999, it's an infant, a child, someone else pointed out. Even if it could one day beat the Scarlet King, it's nowhere near strong enough to yet. We might have days, minutes even, before he arrives, and I don't know if 999 has the power to stop his father. Then what if we could make him stronger, Jake replied, a risky idea brewing in his head. Surely you aren't suggesting. Suddenly a loud rumbling rang out, like an earthquake, only much louder. And instead of coming from the ground below, the noise was coming from the sky. The Foundation's researchers raced in the nearest window or ran out of the buildings they were in to turn their gazes upward. Scored across the sky above was a deep, blood-red crack, a wound in the fabric of reality itself. It was huge, almost covering one horizon to the next, and everyone looking at it knew what it meant. That crack in the sky heralded the approach of the Scarlet King. Junior researcher Harrison spent the next hour impatiently trying to get a hold of someone, anyone, who could approve his proposal. The O5 Council were already swamped with suggestions for how to stop the Scarlet King, each one contributing to his rapid approach. Eventually, Jake made it through and spoke directly with a representative, an underling for the O5 Council. Listen to me, he urged. I know this isn't your department, but I need someone to sign off on this, please. The lives of everyone in this reality could depend on it. What are you proposing? The clockworks, SCP-914, Jake answered. We place SCP-999 inside, speed up the process, and make him strong enough to stop the Scarlet King. It was an astronomical gamble, using the anomalous improvement machine, constructed of a multitude of clockwork components, cogs, gyros, gears. SCP-914 was a device that could be used to enhance or refine any object placed inside its input booth. Depending on the setting, items could be transformed, destroyed, or vastly improved using the clockworks. Rough setting disintegrated any test subject, while coarse dismantled it to its base components. One-to-one -one replaced any item with an almost identical copy. Then there were the fine and very fine settings. The former would cause 914 to improve any item and the later capable of the same but with one key difference. Very fine would refine an object even more 
usually by giving it anomalous properties. Jake had read up on SCP-914 and knew that the Foundation had permitted researchers to conduct tests using the machine. However, following a catastrophic test, nothing organic could be tested in SCP-914. That was a strict rule. No biological organism or living thing of any description was to be placed within the clockworks. It was Jake's hope, however, that desperate times called for desperate measures. Surely, with the Scarlet King almost upon them, the Council would waive the restriction and allow SCP-999 to undergo refinement. The O5 Council representative's voice cut out after Jake made his suggestion. There was a long pause. Even without the pressure of incoming calamity, the silence seemed to extend for a painfully long time. Suddenly, someone else spoke up in their place, a modulated, distorted voice. It quickly became clear to Jake that he was talking directly to a member of the O5 Council. Under a different set of circumstances, he might have felt honored, but right now it was almost as scary as the threat of destruction by the Scarlet King. Listen closely, junior researcher, the council member said on the other end of the comm line. You may think you understand SCP-914. You may even think that it might aid us in stopping the current crisis, but you are far, far mistaken. You will cease this current course of action immediately. Your proposal has been denied. But wait! Jake protested. Surely it could work. I, I know biological material isn't permitted inside the clockworks, but that doesn't mean it can't affect living matter. SCP-999 is a living organism. If he really is everything we think he is, and we just put him through the refinement process, he could- No, researcher Harrison, the voice barked. Using the clockworks would mean we risk losing 999. What are you talking about? You appear to have a fundamental misunderstanding of SCP-914, junior researcher. The council member chastised. It doesn't merely improve upon existing objects, but replaces them with a new version it creates. If we were to place 999 inside the creature as we know it would be gone forever, and if it really is capable of stopping this catastrophe, we will then have lost our ultimate weapon against the Scarlet King. But, but Jake tried to say, enough! Every second we waste discussing our options, the more power the Scarlet King is able to amass. So why don't we stop talking and actually do something? The young researcher shouted, giving in to his frustration and losing his temper. The comm line went dead. There was no one on the other end anymore. Another rumbling sound rippled through the building, even louder than the last tremor. Jake ran towards a nearby window and looked out in horror. It was already too late. The red crack above had split open wider, and like a tidal wave, Hordes of nightmarish creatures came spilling out, raining down on the world, and commanding them, sending forth his minions in a flood of destruction, was the Scarlet King himself. Jake was done waiting for permission from the council. He sprinted as fast as he could through the facility, past panicked researchers fleeing for their lives while security officers and MTF troops abandoned their posts in the futile hope they could survive the end of this reality and all others. Jake forced himself not to pay attention. He needed to find SCP-999. The playful blob was often free to roam around the facility, improving the days of anyone it encountered. So all Jake needed to do was find anyone who seemed happy despite the catastrophe, and SCP-999 wouldn't be so far away. Outside, the world began to resemble the nightmare that everyone had experienced the night before. Cities were burning as monstrous abominations tore through innocent civilians and ripped buildings and cars to shreds, reducing every nearby standing structure to little more than rubble with frightening speed and ease. The Scarlet King and his armies had been waiting for this moment for centuries, millennia, eons even. And now nothing could stop them from unfueling pure, indulgent chaos on this reality. They had their work cut out for them, subjugating and destroying the entire multiverse, but that isn't to say they weren't enjoying it. People across the Earth were being killed in droves in the name of the Scarlet King. He diverted a significant portion of his forces to attacking the SCP Foundation itself. While the boots on the ground MTF troops, the ones that had remained loyal, were usually a formidable fight, they were no match for the eldritch armies of the Scarlet King. The Horde began to set free other anomalies kept locked up in containment, either by accident when they stormed the Foundation facilities, or intentionally seeking out their cells to spring them. Some SCPs tried to stand up to the Scarlet King and fight back. The likes of the Plague Doctor, the Spectre, and SCP-2800 all tried their best to ward off the oncoming attacks of the Scarlet King's foot soldiers. 
They lasted longer than those who decided instead to run away, turning heel and trying in vain to escape the destructive reach of the Scarlet King. Even anomalies like SCP-106, who could escape to other planes of existence or pocket dimensions, weren't safe. In hiding, they were only prolonging the inevitable. The Scarlet King would find them all. No corner of the multiverse was safe. And of course, some SCPs thrived in the catastrophe. Creatures like SCP-682, the infamous hard-to-destroy reptile, found themselves free to exact revenge on the Foundation and humanity at large. Of these, not all the anomalies gave away their allegiance. 682 in particular was too busy killing anything it came into contact with, whether they were human or part of the Scarlet King's army. But other SCPs gladly swore fealty with the Crimson Cosmic Conqueror, forming alliances with the entity responsible for setting them loose and joining the mass of monstrosities he had unleashed. And yet, in the midst of all the chaos, the calamity, and the millions upon millions of deaths, one junior SCP Foundation researcher was still searching for the wholesome orange blob. Jake Harrison had put all his chips on SCP-999 and eventually tracked the tickle monster down. The building around him was crumbling, attacks from the Scarlet King and his minions bombarding every second. As Jake ran into the mess hall, his eyes instantly caught sight of the ball of orange slime cowering under a table. Hey, hey, he whispered, hoping to coax it out. It's okay, I know there's a lot going on right now. Hell, it's the end of the world outside, but if you come with me, I, I think we can fix it together. Come on, little guy, what do you say? As if in reply, 999 immediately leaped up out of its hiding place. Jake caught it in his arms, instantly feeling a wave of calm wash over him thanks to the tickle monster's calming anomalous effect. He tried to stop himself from fully succumbing to the good vibes that the gelatinous creature provided. After all, he still had a job to do, and time was short. The Scarlet King and his invading army might have seemed, for the most part, to be indulging in wanton destruction, decimating cities and foundation sites, killing humans left, right, and center. But Jake figured that if there was any method to their madness, then SCP-999 would be at the very center of it. Not even the Scarlet King knew for certain if SCP-999 really was his offspring. Maybe he had heard the rumors and wanted to reach the Tickle Monster just before it had a chance to stop him, if it even could. If the Scarlet King believed even for a second that his supposed son stood a chance at defeating him and ending his reign of terror, then he'd waste no time hunting the orange blob down. His army of nightmarish creatures would comb every corner of the world until they found SCP-999 although they might not think to look inside the clockworks. Placing the smiling, slimy SCP in the input booth, Jake fiddled with the controls for SCP-914. He'd never performed any experiments using the machine before, but it was all pretty self-explanatory, throwing the dial to very fine. He gave a moment's pause, looking at the adorable anomaly in the machine. The warning from the council rang in his ears. If he activated the clockworks, he'd, in effect, be killing SCP-999. Either that, or the Scarlet King would do it himself when he found the Tickle Monster. Neither scenario ended well. Then the thundering sounds of the massacre outside got louder. Screams coming from innocent people who were being caught in the Scarlet King's carnage. There was no question about it. If what Jake was about to do really could stop all this mayhem, then it was worth replacing SCP-999 to do it. With a deep breath, he flipped the switch. The clicking and clacking of the clockwork's components whirred into life were drowned out by the approaching tremors. Something was coming. No, he was coming, Jake thought. The very fabric of the building around him started shaking, brickwork and cement crumbling and falling apart as a large hand, fingers ending and pointed crimson claws wrenched open the roof with ease. Looking up in horror, Jake saw that the sky was a dark shade of red. Towering over it, a colossal crimson-clad warrior looked in on the frightened researcher, horns protruding from its head. Maybe because SCP-999 was still nearby, the blob was offering him some kind of positive mental protection. Otherwise, the mere sight of the gigantic monstrous being above him would have driven Jake and any other mortal mad. The Scarlet King was upon him. Where is he? came a booming voice that sounded like hundreds of screams overlaying each other. The Scarlet King's gaze seemed to shift slightly, turning from Jake as he lay helplessly on the ground to look at SCP-914. The machine had fully activated, 
and couldn't be stopped now. Either through foreknowledge or some kind of cosmic sense, the eldritch monstrosity seemed to know exactly what the device did. No! No! What have you done? The Scarlet King roared. He raised a gargantuan fist and brought it straight down through the air towards Jake. He couldn't run. The Scarlet King was so vast in size that there was no way the researcher would be able to evade the oncoming strike. Jake raised his arms in a futile attempt to protect himself, despite knowing that the Scarlet King's fist would likely plunge through the very surface of the earth below. But then again, maybe the junior researcher just didn't want to watch. There was a pause. The strike never came. It was only when Jake built up the courage to open his eyes that he saw what had happened. A long tendril of orange slime had reached out of SCP-914, forming a protective barrier between Jake and the Scarlet King. Suddenly, with all the force of a tidal wave, the newly refined SCP-999 came pouring out of the clockworks. The Tickle Monster's mass had increased. He was thousands, if not millions of times bigger. Swept aside and out of harm's way by the orange slime, the junior researcher looked up in amazement as SCP-999 reached up into the sky, able to look its supposed father face to face. The Scarlet King recoiled in horror as the Tickle Monster engulfed him, pulling the cosmic Crimson Plunderer into an embrace. As they hugged, there seemed to be a change in the Scarlet King. The Eldritch Monster had spent all his time since the dawn of creation as a cruel, nihilistic conqueror. He had killed and enslaved, devoured ancient gods, and slaughtered entire planes of existence in his quest to annihilate everything. But now, held tight by his gelatinous son, his heart shifted. It was as if the Scarlet King's eyes had been opened, and he could see the beauty of creation. The sheer overwhelming goodness of SCP-999 enhanced by SCP-914 undid the evil of the Scarlet King himself. Only, it didn't stop. As the orange slime engulfed the Scarlet King in a hug, he began to be unmade. The tickle monster, without even trying to harm its father, had been made into such a beacon of pure positivity by the clockworks that the Scarlet King simply ceased to exist. He was unwoven, not killed, but rendered without any purpose. He barely even felt any pain, but at the same time was removed from this and every other universe. And still, it didn't stop. The newly recreated SCP-999 spread across the world like an orange flood. The Scarlet King's armies, the other SCPs, even the few surviving human beings were all wiped away. SCP-999 spread to every corner of the Earth, turning the blue planet orange as he coated it purging every single scrap of negativity, all hatred, all cruelty, all evil, even that of the SCP Foundation itself. The entire world was unmade by the Tickle Monster, not out of malice, but so that nobody anywhere could cause the Scarlet King to reemerge. At the same time, all that was left was a planet-sized ball of orange slime, lonely spinning through space. There are some people who would get tired of being placed in charge of SCP-914 or the clockworks. The monotony of it all might make most of us go mad. The same routine, day after day, placing an infinite number of objects into the intake booth of the machine, selecting one of the modes, be it rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or very fine, and seeing just what sort of transformation takes place. But there was one employee of the SCP Foundation who liked that routine just fine. Dr. Gears was happy with his position. The simplicity of the routine, the predictability of it all. He liked when the days stacked neatly together in a row of uneventful stretches of time. It was why he ate the exact same meal for lunch every day. A plain turkey sandwich on white bread, a cup of water, and a single banana. Of course, there was some variety in the events that came about when testing the clockworks. There was that incident with Dr. Curtis, and the pound of bacon placed inside the machine alongside a photograph of SCP-682. It had resulted in a miniature replica of SCP-682 made entirely out of bacon, capable of movement, and extremely hostile. Though its size prevented it from doing any damage, it did still attempt to kill any staff it could find. It had smelled mouthwatering. But Dr. Gears had suspended Dr. Curtis from testing with SCP-914 for the trouble, and a day of having bacon grease cleaned off of every surface in the vicinity. There was also the incident that occurred when Dr. Hertz, in an attempt to score some free music production, 
placed a CD of his own original guitar songs into the machine on the setting Very Fine. Rather than improving the production quality of the tracks on the CD, the machine produced a completely silent CD, as well as a collection of books on songwriting, singing, and playing the guitar for beginners. Dr. Gears had to physically drag Dr. Hertz from the room when, upset by the blow to his ego, he attempted to attack the machine. And, of course, there had been the highly destructive Super Bouncy Ball incident, which resulted in 45 casualties and staggering damage to the facility, as well as the aforementioned ball, which was currently thought to be somewhere in space, most likely orbiting Mars. But for the most part, it was always the same thing. An object went in, a setting was selected, and the object came out in a new, modified state. Wash, rinse, repeat, just like it said on the back of the bottle of the brand of unscented shampoo Dr. Gears had been using for the past 30 years. That was how he liked it. And as he sat at his desk, going over the test logs and preparing to supervise another round of tests, he turned on some of his favorite tunes. Well, I say tunes, but it was really a white noise machine. He didn't care for music. It was a bit too much excitement. He was just getting into the flow of his work when there was a knock at his office door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. A research assistant was standing at the door, pale and anxious, a clipboard in his hands. They're, um, requesting your help with an emergency down the hall. What is it? Dr. Gears asked. They didn't really say, just something about Dr. Bright and, um, <clears throat> chainsaws? The assistant stammered. Dr. Gears sighed and stood up from his desk. I'll be right there. There wouldn't be anyone keeping an eye on SCP-914, but at this point, the experimentation process basically ran itself. Everything would be fine if Dr. Gears stepped away for a little while, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, across the site, a very enterprising mask became keenly aware of an opportunity presenting itself. It had been lying in wait, meticulously planning and plotting for days. And now, there was an opening it could take advantage of. You see, months ago, the mask had managed to finagle itself a host, a researcher who had just been working with SCP-914. When the mask's consciousness took over the man's and it delved into all of his thoughts as they were snuffed out one by one, it learned all about the marvelous, miraculous clockworks, the machine capable of transforming anything into a better version of itself. The mask had fantasized, obsessed about getting to SCP-914, of using it to mold itself, to change into something greater and more powerful. Then, perhaps, it could escape this place and return to its former freedom and glory. Of course, it would have to select the right setting. One wrong choice, and the whole plan could amount to nothing. On rough, the mask would likely be destroyed, reduced to a pile of ceramic dust or perhaps even a ball of unmolded clay alongside some of the black slime always oozing from its eyes and mouth. On course, it would likely be transformed into a slab of plain porcelain, uncarved and unpainted. On one-to-one, -one, the mask would likely be swapped out with another anomalous object, some other enterprising mask, or perhaps a haunted Victorian doll or some other malicious inanimate thing. And what use would that be? No, that wouldn't do at all. Fine could be promising, and would likely prevent the mask from degrading any future hosts it decided to take. But why stop there? Why should it limit itself to simply fine, when very fine was right there and looking oh so promising? It decided if it could get to SCP-914, it would find a way to transform itself using the very fine setting. And then, its enemies, this pathetic foundation, the entire world, would fall to their knees. It had been waiting patiently, like a snake coiled and ready to snap up its prey, spreading its psychic tendrils as far as they could go, and anticipating the moment that someone left SCP-914 unattended. Huh. Now, the moment had arrived. Of course, the mask would need help. It didn't have a way to reach the clockworks on its own, so it had been wrapping its influence around the guard station just outside its door dripping thoughts into his head, whispering darkness into his ear at every chance it got, chipping away at his will bit by bit until the man was little more than a puppet with the possessive mask tugging at his strings. The mask gave a mental yank on one of those strings, 
calling the man in its thrall into the room. First, he knocked out his fellow guard with the butt of his gun. At this point, his mind was so pliable that he would do anything to please the mask. Next, the man entered the containment chamber, a glassy, vacant look in his eyes. He unlocked the glass case and reached inside, lifting the mask out and bringing it one step closer to absolute freedom. He tucked the mask inside of his uniform, hiding it away from any prying eyes, and began to walk steadily towards SCP-914's room. All the while, the mask whispered silent encouragements into the man's weakened mind, promising him power and success beyond his wildest dreams. If only he would help it achieve this goal. Of course, the mask was planning to kill the man as soon as his task was done, but he didn't need to know that yet. Every step brought the mask closer to victory, and it was practically vibrating with the delicious anticipation of it all. Soon, so soon, they reached the containment room, the clockworks just beyond the door. The guard carried the mask into the room, placed the mask inside of the intake booth, closed it, and approached the control panel. In accordance with the mask's psychic instructions, he selected very fine and turned the machine on. The cogs and gears inside whirred to life. The engine sputtered, metal clanked, and pipes exhaled hissing bursts of energy. The output chamber opened, and through the curtain of steam, SCP-035 stepped in its new and improved form. That's right, step. First, one long, sinewy leg, leathery, shiny, and black as the night, extended into view. Another leg followed, and along with it came a torso, a pair of arms, a slender neck, and the familiar face of the mask, stark white against the darkness of its new body. The feet ended in little points, as if the figure was wearing boots, but there was no visible clothing. It was all one being, angular and strange, with long, long fingers tipped with curved claws. The mask let out a wicked cackle, throwing back its head in triumph. <laughs> Excellent. It's even better than I imagined. The mask turned to the guard that had helped it escape. Thank you for your service. Now I have one last favor to ask you. It was time for the mask to test its powers, to see how the clockworks had strengthened what was already there, what more it was capable of in this enhanced state. I want you to go into the cafeteria, walk into the kitchen, and climb into the oven, would you? Make sure you turn it on nice and hot first. It waited for a few seconds before the man nodded solemnly, turned and left the room, heading off in the direction of the cafeteria. It listened as the moments passed, and the sound of horrified, shocked screams rang out, and it knew that the man had followed its instructions exactly. At the mask's orders, he had cooked himself for lunch. The mask clapped its hands together, cackling again. <laughs> wonderful, oh wonderful. Now that's taken care of, what shall I try next? If the mask had eyebrows, they would have been arched in a truly devilish expression. First, it wanted to test its abilities on a truly formidable opponent, someone worthy of the mask's time and attention. Casually as you please, it strode over to one particular containment chamber to see about an unkillable reptile. As it walked, several guards took notice, pointing their weapons at the mask and ordering it to stand down. Each time it chuckled, and with a wave of its hand, the barrels of their guns warped and twisted into little metal bows, completely useless. It snapped its clawed fingers, and the guards fell to the ground in an unconscious heap. Can't have you sounding the alarm yet. The fun is only just beginning, the mask remarked, though it knew the guards couldn't hear it. It kicked open the door to SCP-682's containment room with a jaunty greeting. <laughs> Hello, you scaly fool. I come to pay you a visit. The reptile did not respond, incapacitated by its hydrochloric acid bath. That just wouldn't do. The mass concentrated, and the steel chamber broke apart, acid spilling everywhere, hissing as it splashed onto any available surface. SCP-682 lifted its head, twitching its tail, and took in the sight of the new and improved mask. What do you think? 
the mask posed for the creature laughing again. It seemed it couldn't stop laughing lately. Its expression fixed into a permanent, gleeful smile. It couldn't help it. Freedom and power just felt so good. Disgusting. SCP-682 remarked, unimpressed with this display. It lunged at the mask, preparing to attack, but the mask held up a hand to stop it. Not so fast. SCP-682 suddenly froze in place, eyes rolling wildly as it tried desperately in vain to move. Let's see, what should I do with you? The mask was itching to test out its reality warping abilities. It had the feeling that there was very little it couldn't do in this state, and wanted to see just how far its power could go. But what would be suitable punishment? What could be the cruelest possible thing to do to such a creature? The mask could simply try to kill it, to finally snuff out this endless, miserable life. But that would be a release. That would be far too easy. Aha. Uh -huh. A light bulb went off in the mask's twisted mind. Perfect. It waved its hand, releasing SCP-682 from its paralysis, but as the massive lizard snapped its jaws and moved to take a bite out of the mask, it lost its balance, falling to the ground. Its legs had begun to shrink, rapidly knocking its center of gravity askew. Soon the rest of its body began to follow, getting smaller and smaller at an unbelievable pace, until finally, where there had once stood a massive, impossible prehistoric beast, was something resembling a baby alligator. A tiny little tail thrashing about, short stubby legs, bulbous eyes, and a mouth full of sharp but adorable, non-threatening teeth. When the shrunken SCP-682 spoke, its voice was high-pitched and squeaky. It roared. Yes, you are. The mask turned and left, thoroughly pleased with its work and shut the door behind it. Now, what other fellow anomalies could the mask exercise its absolute superiority over? It pondered other supposedly dangerous and deadly entities that it had heard about over its time in Foundation custody. It all seemed so laughable now. There was only one true danger within these walls, and it was the mask. Oh, what about that abominable sculpture? The ugly thing with a penchant for snapping necks, but only when a person wasn't looking at it. The absolute coward. Cowards didn't deserve to live, the mask decided, and it made its way over toward SCP-173's containment cell. Inside, there were several D-Class staring at the statue with wide, unblinking eyes, each person terrified of being the one to let their guard down and lose their life in the process. None of them would die today, however. At least, not at the hands of the statue. As the D-Class in the cell watched, never once taking their eyes off of SCP-173, the statue's head began to twist and rotate, the sound of cracking snow and creaking metal reverberating through the room. The mask used its telekinetic abilities to rend the statue's head from its neck, relishing the irony of breaking the thing's neck just as it had done to so many others. It wasn't about justice, of course. The mask had no taste for such insipid and human things. It just found the whole image quite funny. The entire thing began to crumble apart, like a sandcastle beneath an ocean wave, disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of pebbles and dust. Just like that, SCP-173 was no more. As for the D-Class in the cell, well, the mask could use some servants. You all, come with me, the mask ordered, flexing its iron will and quickly capturing the weak, fear-addled minds of the D-Class personnel before it. They fell in line, shuffling out the door and following the mask with the same blank expressions as the guard before. Whatever was left of their personalities after so much time being used and abused by the Foundation, it was gone now, replaced only with the will of the Mighty Mask. As the Mask continued its victory tour of the Foundation, now with four mindless servants in tow, it passed the staff break room. Through the window, it spotted one Dr. Bright, the telltale amulet around his neck, <laughs> microwaving some leftover pizza. The Mask had always found Dr. Bright distasteful, with the self-aggrandizing pranks and general dedication to chaos with no grand vision behind it, no meaningful agenda. 
It was pitiful. It was deeply ugly. And now the mask had a chance to put an end to the immortal doctor's antics once and for all. It opened the door, greeting Dr. Bright with that frozen grin. Oh, doctor. Dr. Bright's eyes widened, and he didn't even hear the microwave behind him ding, signaling that his pizza was ready. He was too distracted by the horrifying sight before him. But as he opened his mouth to scream, to call for help, the mask reached out and ripped the amulet from his neck. The host body fell limply to the ground, and the mask looked down at the amulet, glinting in the light that held Dr. Bright's consciousness inside. It stared at the amulet with a flinty gaze, and under its empty stare, the metal began to rust, to degrade, and to melt into an unrecognizable slurry. The mask let it drip onto the floor. Then, when all that was Dr. Bright had melted away, it wiped its hand off with a napkin and ground the wet puddle on the ground with its heel. Goodbye, doctor, the mask hissed. Now, what's next? But as the mask turned to walk down the hall, it came face to face with a disapproving face. SCP-343 had manifested directly in front of the mask, and he clearly had learned of the mask's behavior so far that day. You've been busy. <laughs> yes, very busy. Lots to do, you see. The mask chuckled smugly. You understand why I can't allow this to continue, right? 343's expression remained stern but calm. You believe you can stop me? The mask tilted its head to the side. Of course I can. SCP-343 sighed. But you could stop on your own, if you would rather. I prefer to avoid an unnecessary conflict. The mask giggled uncontrollably at this. <laughs> I am going to rend the flesh from your bones, it simply said. I thought you might say something like that. I'm going to have to take your body. I'm sorry. SCP-343 prepared to teleport the mask's new body to another location, separating them and reducing the mask to its original, more manageable state. But before he could, there was sudden darkness in the room, every light blinking out all at once. The hall was plunged into shadow, but this was no ordinary darkness. This darkness was inky, thick, cloaking like smoke clinging to the inside of your throat. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the darkness dissipated, but SCP-343 was gone. He hadn't teleported himself to somewhere else. He hadn't walked through the wall to get away from the mask. He was truly gone. The mask couldn't be certain exactly what it had done to SCP-343, but it knew that the enemy had been truly eradicated. In fact, it was fairly certain he had been erased from reality entirely. The mask made one final lap around the Foundation containment site, bidding farewell to every anomaly it passed. Some it transformed like it had done to SCP-682. Taking inspiration from its bird-like face, the mask turned the Plague Doctor into a crow. Others it simply executed, such as the poor SCP-096, whose screams and shrieks had always irritated the mask. Of course, the Foundation began to notice what was happening, and they tried to defeat the mask. They shot at it with their puny weapons, they sounded their useless alarms, and they called for their laughable backup. But none of it mattered, not in the face of the mask. Guns melted in guards' hands, alarms went silent at nothing more than a glance, and more and more mindless slaves joined the mask's army. It didn't want too many. That would just be difficult to keep track of, but an even dozen seemed like the perfect number. With this miniature army in tow, the mask finally made its way to its final destination, the exit. It had been waiting for this moment, dreaming of it, since it was first imprisoned so long ago. As it stepped out into the sun, the mask realized that though it didn't have nostrils, it could smell the breeze, the scent of wildflowers and grass. What a beautiful place to mold into the mask's image of an ideal world. The world was its oyster, and the mask longed to swallow it whole. The current whereabouts of the possessive mask are unknown, 
the Foundation is doing its best to locate the mask and determine new effective measures for bringing it down and recontaining it as soon as possible. The escape of the mask is being considered a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario, if it cannot be stopped. The best and brightest minds at the Foundation are working on it, aside from Dr. Bright, of course, may he rest in peace. But right now, there is very little anyone can do. So if you see a strange dark figure in a white mask walking down the street, do yourself a favor and run the other way, before it's too late. Panic and terror gripped everyone in the Foundation facility. Well, everyone who was still alive, that is. Guards were working tirelessly to fight back and regain control of the building, but they didn't have enough bullets to suppress the oncoming horde. Somehow, a sample of SCP-008 that was being examined for testing purposes had managed to spread to one of the research staff. Before long, the very same researcher was now a mindless zombie, a reanimated corpse that had managed to bite several other staff members, spreading the infection. It didn't matter that this original carrier was shot down by security personnel. It had already done its damage and passed on SCP-008. By now, there were too many of them to simply bonk each one on the head and neutralize it. The Foundation facility had gone into full-scale lockdown, an emergency quarantine to try and limit the spread of the deadly virus. Any exit to the outside world was shut and would stay sealed tight until someone from the Foundation could do something. But that meant the few surviving members of staff trapped inside were at the mercy of the zombie horde. Their options were limited. SCP-500 was known to perfectly cure those infected with SCP-008, but with all exits locked, it was impossible to get any of the remaining SCP-500 pills on site. Then one of the surviving researchers, one Dr. Omel, had an idea. It was an insanely risky plan, one that the Foundation would never sign off on, but desperate times called for desperate measures. Gathering up the remaining security forces that hadn't been infected with SCP-008, along with a research assistant that had managed to escape the zombies, Dr. Omel and his band of survivors headed deeper into the facility. While the external doors were all locked to prevent the SCP-008 infectees from making it out and spreading the virus to the wider world, the doors inside the facility were all still functioning, and it was a good thing too. Dr. Omel's plan relied on opening the doors to two anomalies, SCP-914 The Clockworks, a machine capable of destroying or refining anything placed inside of it, and SCP-049, The Plague Doctor. It was a shot in the dark at best. Omel had observed the Plague Doctor for some time and knew that the beak-faced surgeon was capable of creating zombie-like creatures known as SCP-049-2 not dissimilar from the zombies infected with SCP-008. If anyone could potentially fix this nightmare, there were few as well-versed in anomalous medicine as SCP-049. Taking him to the clockworks was, however, an even bigger risk. Normally, SCP-049 killed any he touched and turned their deceased bodies into SCP-049-2s, hence Dr. Omel calling for a refinement of the Plague Doctor's abilities. Placing him in the input booth of SCP-914 and setting it to very fine, Omel prayed he'd made the right call. He could hear the horde of SCP-008 pounding outside the locked door. What emerged from the clockworks was still recognizable as SCP-049, retaining his beaked mask, although the mask itself was actually flesh and bone, a part of his skull. His robes now flowed out behind him as a pair of dark, feathery wings, giving him an even more bird-like appearance. Despite this, SCP-049 had claimed that he'd never been a bird before. I'll admit, I didn't expect wings, the surviving assistant remarked. That's not so surprising, really, Dr. Omel admitted. He did lay an egg that one time. What? He did what? Before an explanation could be given, the SCP-008 zombies managed to break down the door and came flooding into the room. Omel recoiled in horror as they snarled and shuffled closer, reaching towards him with decrepit fingers. Suddenly, SCP-049 swooped into the path of the encroaching undead with a flap of his new wings. Calmly, he gave a gentle move of his hand, like lifting something from a shelf. A bizarre contraption appeared around his forearm, a gauntlet connected to syringes that were strapped to each of his fingers, 
all filled with various different fluids. Dr. Omel was amazed. SCP-049 seemed to now have the anomalous ability to summon surgical equipment from a tiny pocket dimension. It was almost exactly like how SCP-076-2 Abel drew his weapons. Reaching towards the nearest SCP-008 zombie, still moving with the utmost calm, SCP-049 stated, Now try to hold still. He spoke in a gentle voice, with the bedside manner most medical doctors would be incapable of. This might sting a little. With that, SCP-049 pushed the syringes into the zombie, the fluids draining from each one, then refilling as he withdrew his hand. The SCP-008 instance froze for a moment, almost like it was confused before it began to emit what looked to be steam, as though it had stepped out of a hot shower, shaking uncontrollably. The necrosis and telltale signs of infection seemed to disappear, like being washed away until all that was left of the SCP-008 zombie was the infected researcher it had been before. The man was alive and well, much to Dr. Omel's astonishment. SCP-049 hadn't just cured the SCP-008 infection, he'd actually reversed it leaving the infectee alive and well. It took a few hours for SCP-049 to fly around the facility on his new wings, effortlessly turning all the SCP-008 zombies back into their old selves one by one. By the time he was done, everyone on site that had previously been exposed to SCP-008 was cured, and it didn't stop there. The Foundation still mandated everyone who was previously infected to remain in quarantine whilst they were examined, demanding the now-refined SCP-049 to remain in his cell, which he politely complied with. When the SCP Foundation doctors took a look at the formerly zombified staff, they were amazed at what they found. Each one had all traces of SCP-008 completely removed from their systems. Trying to re-expose them to the virus, their bodies now seemed to be able to generate anomalous antibodies that rejected and fought off infection by SCP-008 in a manner of seconds. The plague doctor had made everyone immune. Upon further testing, examining skin and blood cells from the former infectees, and performing full top-to-bottom health checks, the Foundation doctors learned something else, too. Everyone that SCP-049 had cured was even healthier than they had been before. One security guard had been a one-pack-a-day smoker for ten years, but an x-ray revealed any damage to his lungs, mouth, and throat had all been completely reversed. On every possible internal and external level, the formerly zombified personnel had all been returned to pristine health by SCP-049. Eager to witness the full extent of these new anomalous abilities the Clockworks had given him, the SCP Foundation struck a deal with SCP-049. If he performed a mission for them, then they would provide him with the means to have anything he wanted. For a moment, the Plague Doctor pondered their terms, and then agreed. What is it you want in return? Dr. Omel had asked. To cure the world, Doctor. SCP-049 replied simply. The Plague Doctor flew as fast as his wings would carry him to the location the Foundation had given him. It was an isolated region in Siberia, kept completely cut off from the rest of the world by guards working around the clock. Arriving at the edge of the frozen town, SCP-049 was approached by the security commander and given his full directive from the Foundation. Your objective, I'm told, is simple. You enter the restricted area and neutralize anything you come into contact with. When you're done, return here, and we'll report the results to command. Thank you, Commander. The Plague Doctor nodded graciously. You have been most helpful. He didn't ask what was out there, merely turned and began walking through the snow until he could no longer be seen by the eye. Maybe he had already sensed what was out there, what kind of sickness plagued this place, and understood exactly what the Foundation were asking him to do. If SCP-049 had any questions, he did not make them known. Instead, he just headed off in search of every instance of SCP-610 he could find. There was quiet for an uncomfortably long while. The personnel standing guard at the edge of the area watched through the snowfall, ready if anything started slithering its way towards them. The Foundation's security all tensed when the motion sensor picked up movement, accompanied by the sounds of fighting and the bizarre inhuman noises from instances of SCP-610. Then, after another long period of unsettling quiet, somebody spotted a gently glowing light making its way through the snow. As it drew closer, 
The glow of a burning makeshift torch made it clear that the figure holding it was SCP-049, and as he made his way towards the rendezvous point, it quickly became apparent he wasn't alone. Shivering in the freezing cold and wet from the snow, covered in scraps of dirty clothing and whatever else they could find, was a huddled mass of people. All of them looked bewildered, following the light of SCP-049's torch like a guiding beacon towards the edge of the perimeter. The Foundation security all stood slack-jawed in amazement at what happened. While the Plague Doctor led the people and urged the commander that they all needed warmer clothing immediately, he had done it. SCP-049 had cured the flesh that hates. In the coming months, the Foundation soon found themselves very busy. Everyone who had previously been infected by SCP-610 needed to be screened and examined, just to make absolutely sure there was no chance they could mutate into a fleshy monstrosity again. But just like before with the former SCP-008 zombies, these people were in perfect condition, cured and healthier than they had ever been. By using his new anomalous surgical skill and healing power, SCP-049 had returned the flesh that hates victims back into human beings. It was starting to seem like there was no disease, no infection, anomalous or otherwise, that he could not cure. The Foundation began an effort to rehouse the former SCP-610 infectees. Given that most of them had spent years as aggressive anomalous abominations, almost every one of them had officially been pronounced dead and couldn't just go back to their old lives. The SCP Foundation gradually reintroduced them into the world, setting up new identities and integrating them into new countries. SCP-049 even personally helped console some of those that struggled with the adjustment, offering to give them therapy to aid in the process. He was more than just a plague doctor, it seemed, thanks to the clockworks. SCP-049's good work didn't stop with curing the flesh that hates either. As promised, the Foundation allowed him to carry out his newfound purpose. Whereas before he was obsessed with eradicating what he called the pestilence, now the Plague Doctor seemed to be directing all of his focus to curing the world, as he put it. And he started with some of his fellow anomalies. The Plague Doctor started experimenting with his new tools, concocting cures and serums aplenty by pulling whatever he needed from an endless supply of equipment and ingredients at his fingertips. He developed a cure for the condition that caused Daniel McIntyre to become SCP-2800 Cactus Man. His skin reverted back to normal, no longer sporting spines, while the plant-like parts of his DNA once again became human. SCP-049 even offered a sympathetic ear to a lot of Daniel's troubles, giving him therapy through a lot of his mental health difficulties. SCP-2102 was also one of SCP-049's successful patients. His condition of rapidly overproducing new skin tissue when injured quickly became a thing of the past. Then the Plague Doctor turned his sights to the wider world, working tirelessly to create new vaccinations and treatments for diseases that were once thought to be incurable. Everything he made and had the Foundation distribute to those that needed it was all 100% effective. People were healthier and happier than ever, all thanks to the Plague Doctor. Until they weren't. In attempting to eradicate disease the world over, a new strain of illness emerged. SCP-049 took to calling it a new pestilence, and it was nothing short of horrific. It would have been considered anomalous at one time, but it quickly became so widespread that it couldn't be contained. All the Plague Doctor's advanced medical treatments had encouraged this disease to mutate, to adapt against everything he could throw at it. It could infect any person at any time and present itself with virtually any symptoms. It resisted drugs, any form of treatment, and it spread rapidly. Eventually, while trying to come up with a way to protect people from the strain of superbacteria, this new pestilence, SCP-049 started to fall ill. He had caught it, and even with his refinement, he was beginning to weaken. The Plague Doctor was dying, and once he was gone, the whole world would soon follow as more and more people caught the sickness. There was only one thing he could do, a way to leave someone behind to carry on his work. When the Foundation, those that weren't yet ill, found SCP-049, he had already passed. But alongside his body was something smooth and pearlescent, an egg, and inside, maybe a chance for the world to be cured. We really shouldn't be doing this. Adams argued. It's fine, it's just a test. 
his fellow researcher Burton retorted in protest. The containment procedures for SCP-914 come with a very specific warning not to test biological matter in it. If anyone had found out what we were doing, we would both be fired. Or worse, dosed up with amnestics and left on a sidewalk somewhere with no clue who we were. Burton rolled their eyes. Adam's concern was hardly unfounded, but when they had discussed the idea earlier, he'd seemed open to it. Then again, it was only a hypothetical back then. Now it was getting closer to becoming reality. Look, aren't you tired of what we do here? Burton argued indignantly. So many of the tests we run end up with dead D-class personnel, blood everywhere, or just end up creating new anomalies that will just only go on to cause more people to die. I'm sick of it. I don't think this course of action is the best solution to that, though, their colleague urged. Why not? SCP-2800 is one of the few anomalies either of us have ever encountered that we can categorically consider to be good. He's not some heartless monster or vengeful cosmic deity, he just wants to do the right thing. I already mentioned it to him, he's more than happy to undergo the change. And what if it kills him? Adams asked. No, what if it works? Burton responded, sidestepping that possibility entirely. Worst case scenario, he might not survive, sure, but best case? We could turn an ineffectual would-be superhero into a tool to do some real, lasting good. The pair of researchers went back and forth, until ultimately, Adams conceded. It was hard to deny that throwing any number of other SCPs into the clockwork refinement machine known as SCP-914 would easily yield far more destructive results. But SCP-2800 was, as Burton rightfully pointed out, a being of well-meaning intentions. If any average person were to wake up to find their body had developed characteristics consistent with that of a saguaro cactus, they'd likely seek out immediate medical assistance. But when that happened to Daniel McIntyre, he immediately sought to use his newfound condition and the anomalous abilities it granted him to offer assistance to any person that needed it as the superhero Cactus Man, the spiked menace. Unfortunately, when intervening in situations, Daniel proved himself to be somewhat ineffectual as a hero, although this didn't deter him from trying. Now housed in containment under the designation SCP-2800, Cactus Man still continued to offer assistance to the staff of the SCP Foundation. His behavior came as the result of a few diagnosed psychological conditions, particularly his hero complex a deep-rooted desire to help others, no matter the personal cost to Daniel himself. And it was this part of him that caused SCP-2800 to wholeheartedly agree to Researcher Burton's test, unaware that the experiment had not been sanctioned by the wider Foundation. Over here? Cactus Man asked as he stepped into the booth labeled Intake following Researcher Adam's directions. That's perfect, 2800, the researcher replied, offering a thumbs up before he turned away hiding his look of concern. Shall we start with the one-to-one -one setting, Researcher Burton? The hell with that, Burton scoffed. We've got maybe one attempt at this before security notices he's out of his cell and come here to find out what we're up to. We go big or we go home. I'm setting 914 to very fine. Burton strode over to the machine and threw the dial to the highest of its five settings, turning the key below. It wound the mainspring and the entire device churned into life, the door to the intake booth sliding shut. Gears were spinning and grinding, the complex contraption of over 8 million moving parts starting its refinement process. Belts, pulleys, gears, springs, and SCP-914's other clockwork parts all began clicking and clacking, while SCP-2800 stood in the intake booth, growing more and more uneasy at all the noise this strange machine was making. Although the Foundation had little idea how its refinement process worked, SCP-914 seemed to take any object placed within its intake compartment and disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy the item, depending on the setting its control knob was switched to. Ruff completely obliterated an intake object on a molecular level, reducing it to little more than dust. Course dismantled the target into its base components, while one-to-one -one replaced it with a similar item of matching design, size, and quality. The next setting up fine would improve upon the base item, although usually without granting it any anomalous properties. And very fine, well, you can figure it out from there. You're smart. The last time a living being had been placed in SCP-914 on the very fine setting, it had been a D-class, and the results were catastrophic. 
a massive containment failure, numerous casualties including the test subject. Since then, no testing of biological matter was permitted in SCP-914. But Burton was convinced that SCP-2800's innate need to help people, his deep-seated hero complex and generally kind nature, would mean that the outcome was worth breaking the rules. SCP-914 was ticking and worrying, the noises of its components getting louder and louder with each passing second. So loud, in fact, that it drowned out the approaching clump of Foundation issue boots. Freeze! Hands in the air! yelled one of the security team as they burst into research cell 109-B where the machine was housed. The pair of guards assigned to watch it lay tied up and unconscious on the floor. Both researcher Burton and Adams threw their hands up as instructed, struck with panic at being caught in the act. The Foundation security personnel moved in, restraining them, clasping handcuffs tightly around the two researchers' wrists. Suddenly, the noise of the machine stopped. The guards all turned their attention to SCP-914, raising their weapons, training them on the output booth, with no idea what was about to step out. Timidly, as the compartment door slid open, Cactus Man slowly emerged, looking around, confused. As far as Burton could tell from looking, SCP-2800 didn't appear to be any different. He cursed Adams under his breath, irrationally believing that he'd somehow changed the machine setting to one-to-one -to -one during all the commotion. That is, until one of the guards approached Cactus Man to restrain him. As the security officer moved to cuff him, SCP-2800's arm whipped around, as if of its own accord. With the speed and precision of someone with far more hand-to-hand -hand combat training than Daniel had ever received, Cactus Man gently, yet firmly, swatted the Foundation's guard's hands away and turned him around. It had been so easy, so instinctive that SCP-2800 looked even surprised himself, barely able to believe the movements of his own prickly plant-based body. The guard tried to raise his arms again, only to find he couldn't. It was completely numb, in fact. Everywhere SCP-2800 had touched while deflecting him was the same. A series of long, sharp cactus needles from Daniel had been embedded in the security officer's uniform, piercing through his clothing and skin, all the way to his muscles. And yet, it was painless. He could hardly feel any of the sharp protrusions. Cactus Man had disabled him with such effectiveness that the pain didn't even register his spines implanted in the guard's body like acupuncture needles. Then, seeing what he had done, with an instinctive flick of his wrist, SCP-2800 made the spikes withdraw from the officer, and they shot back through the air, reattaching themselves to his body. Following the incident, and a severe reprimand for their unauthorized use of SCP-914, researcher Burton was assigned to reassess SCP-2800's new, improved abilities. The goal behind his investigation was to determine whether Cactus Man had now been rendered a more useful asset for the Foundation, given he had retained his need to offer help to others. They were looking to make use of him. Sure enough, the existing anomalous abilities Daniel had exhibited before his refinement seemed to have become much more formidable powers. SCP-2800 had greater control over the growing of his prickly spines, as shown when he first emerged from SCP-914. Not only could he detach them at will, as he could before, but he seemingly gained an instinctive power to launch them as high-speed projectiles, neither recall them or regrow missing spines at an accelerated rate. On top of that, his reflexes seemed to have greatly improved, as had his fighting prowess, now able to take on multiple adversaries without one of them ever landing a hit on him. His cactacarous retention of water, making him able to survive on around one-third of the water needed by an average human male, was also improved. Now SCP-2800 could survive on next to no water without drying out. Even a few drops was enough to sustain him for an extended period. Additionally, no external factor could cause him to lose water his plant cells were retaining, even being in a high-temperature environment. His resistance to high temperatures, typical of many plants within the cacti family, had now evolved into SCP-2800 being fireproof. He was unable to catch a light, even after direct exposure to flame. Additionally, he had previously been able to empathetically connect and communicate with other cacti, often causing them to increase their water and nutrient absorption. Now though, Cactus Man could cause his fellow spiked plants to rapidly grow at an exponential rate, 
even producing cacti seeds that he could command to grow the instant they made contact with the soil or absorbed moisture retained by his own body. Despite the rules broken to refine him, the Foundation now had their very own plant-powered superhero, ready to be deployed at a moment's notice in the event of a containment breach and more than happy to help. And it couldn't have happened at a more opportune time. Over the coming years, the Foundation granted permission for Cactus Man to assist in various recontainment efforts when dangerous anomalies broke free of their cells. He ended up preventing the deaths of a lot of the Foundation's mobile task force operatives, as well as their various personnel, purely by intervening, so they didn't have to put themselves in jeopardy. However, it was the eventual defeat of SCP-682 that allowed Daniel to really make a name for himself as the full-blown superhero he'd always wanted to be. Nobody was sure how it happened. All that really mattered was the monstrous, hard-to-destroy reptile was loose again. The crocodilian creature, famous for despising all other forms of life, had torn through the Foundation facility where it was being kept. It left a trail of destruction in its wake, causing multiple subsequent containment breaches. And while the Foundation mobilized its forces to try to limit the damage and re-establish containment of the various anomalies now freed, SCP-682 was making its way towards civilization, only to find Cactus Man, the spiked menace, standing in its path. The monstrous lizard snarled at the sight of what it viewed as such a pathetic adversary. Even plant life, especially a sentient humanoid plant, was an abhorrent abomination to SCP-682. Civilians were running in terror of the hard-to-destroy reptile as it made its way through the city slaughtering any in its path. And yet, SCP-2800 was standing bravely against it. We both know they'll catch up to you eventually, Daniel called to the monster. As soon as they'll do, it'll be right back in the vat of acid with ye. I know you're not a fan of being locked up. I'm not either. But you need to go back to your cage. SCP-682 started laughing, a roaring, inhuman sound. It didn't feel the park plant creature was even worth a verbal response. Eh, suit yourself, pal, Cactus Man smirked. He started calmly walking towards the beast as SCP-682 began charging its way through the street, hurtling towards its enemy. Still, SCP-2800 strode without breaking a sweat. Not that a cactus can sweat. But whereas before, he would have doubted himself, especially going up against something as big and ferocious as the hard-to-destroy reptile. Now Daniel was cool and collected. With two seeds in his palm, they quickly grew into round spiked cacti that covered his clenched fists like boxing gloves, with sharp pointed needles sticking out of them. SCP-682 was almost upon him and launched a vicious swipe with its clawed arm. Moving with speed and the Matrix-like reflexes, Cactus Man easily sidestepped the oncoming blow. Before 682 had time to launch another attack, 2800 countered with a Cactacarus countermove. He gave a series of quick jabs, each strike of his fist landing with enough strength to reel the crocodilian creature and leave sharp spines embedded in its snout. The hard-to-destroy reptile backed up, trying to create some distance between it and its surprisingly strong opponent. But Cactus Man wasn't about to let this monster get another chance to attack. Raising both arms, he fired a volley of his cactus spines at the monstrosity, the barrage of razor-sharp needles shredding through the reptile's flesh. More were regrowing in the place of the ones now tearing through SCP-682, supplying Daniel with an infinite supply of spikes to shoot at the reptile as fast as it could regenerate from the damage. Suddenly still being impaled by the bombardment of needles, the crocodilian anomaly gave a wild flailing swipe of its arm. The monster's claws cleaved ruts into Cactus Man's chest, the aggressive move caught him off guard for a split second, just enough time for SCP-682 to thrash its tail and send him hurtling across the street. Cactus Man crashed into the sidewalk with enough force to crack the pavement, knocking down a lamppost and uprooting a fire hydrant. Water was spraying up into the air as he tried to will himself to get back up, struggling with his lack of arms until the cool spray of water came raining down on Daniel and instantly he felt rejuvenated. It was stronger and more invigorating than any sip of coffee or energy drink on the market. Absorbing sunlight and moisture, he renewed his literal green fingers with more newly formed spines protruding through his chlorophyll-filled skin. In seconds, Cactus Man was back to full form, ready to end this fight once and for all. Turning to face the sinister, scaly terror that was SCP-682, 
Daniel Nelton reached his hand into the cracks he had left in the asphalt. His fingers reached deeper right into the soil below, while SCP-682 began to menacingly draw nearer. It charged again, only to feel a rumbling burrowing up through the very earth beneath its feet, until, suddenly, something came bursting up from the ground, sending chunks of road up into the air, overturning nearby cars with the force of whatever it was exploding up from below. Sharp, piercing pain ripped through the hard to destroy reptile's body at multiple points. Its arms, legs, torso were all impaled. Whatever it was kept burrowing upwards, lifting SCP-682 up off the ground as it climbed, no, grew out of the earth. A gigantic cactus had sprouted up, seemingly out of nowhere. It was huge, far bigger than any on record, the size of a large oak tree and still rapidly growing. Its spiked branches reached outwards as it climbed and climbed, pulling apart the limbs of SCP-682 that were impaled on its enormous needles. Separated into several angry, snarling, and thrashing pieces, the hard-to-destroy reptile was bested. All the while, SCP-2800 was concentrating on endlessly regrowing the spines of its miles-tall cactus he had created, keeping SCP-682 skewered long enough for the Foundation to move in and recontain the infamous creature. Crowds of people had witnessed the battle and filmed it on their phones, some even live-streaming the showdown as it happened. By the time the Foundation was about to initiate a cover-up and start administering amnestics, the name Cactus Man was already trending worldwide on social media. News crews flocked to the scene, rushing up to thank SCP-2800 for his heroism. People were cheering and clapping in their gratitude, and what's more, when fire crews and emergency services began tending to those wounded in the reptilian rampage, Daniel was seen aiding them. He helped clear rubble using his plant powers, clearing damaged vehicles and debris from buildings, and offering to help paramedics tend to the wounded. All this while watched by the adoring eyes of the people he wanted to save. It was too late for the Foundation to step in and sweep this incident under the rug. The whole world had seen Cactus Man now, and they loved him. Of course, that didn't stop them from trying to recontain SCP-2800. But when shady vehicles and armored MTF troops appeared to whisk their new hero away, people didn't take kindly to it. Even while unaware of who the Foundation was or what they did, there was a massive public outcry for Cactus Man to be released from whoever had taken him into custody. The Foundation did their best to ignore it, placing Daniel back in his cell for the time being. That was until the worldwide calls of Free Cactus Man grew so loud that even the powers that be started to listen. The governments of the world slowly all started sharing their own support of the plant-powered hero who had risked his life for the safety of ordinary citizens he'd never even met. There were some who blamed the immense collateral damage caused by his fight with SCP-682 on Daniel himself, especially with the gigantic skyscraper-sized cactus permanently standing on the site where the battle took place. However, those detractors were eventually silenced by those with the growing concern of who would protect them if an incident like that ever happened again. Finally, the SCP Foundation were put under enough immense, unignorable pressure by the governments of every country that knew of their existence that there was only one course of action left. The door to Daniel McIntyre was unlocked and open for good, and Cactus Man was free to go. The world welcomed him with open arms. He was awarded medals for bravery thanks to his efforts in saving people by fending off 682. Cactus Man graciously accepted and offered to help out wherever he could, anywhere in the world. Over the coming years, working with intelligence and transportation provided by the Foundation, SCP-2800 was sent anywhere and everywhere. Wherever there was conflict or a natural disaster or even another containment breach, the world had a hero ready and willing to step in. People adored Daniel with many growing varieties of cacti in their homes to honor his heroics, and just in case he ever needed backup should the worst happen. Cactus Man had become a hero beyond his own wildest aspirations. But despite being adored and revered the world over, saving lives was never about fame or recognition to him. The fact remained that Daniel just couldn't help it. Even before being put inside SCP-914 and refined, he had always held doing the right thing above all else no matter the impact it had on himself. He'd risk his own safety, risk being beaten up, injured, or worse, if it meant getting another person out of harm's way. Commendable, some might say. 
but that compulsion never left him. Even after ushering in a new era of peace, SCP-2800 still wanted to help save people. But was there anybody left who needed him to? Well, there was just one man. One Cactus Man who still needed saving. Over the years, a considerable number of innocent people had unknowingly wandered into SCP-3008. Otherwise known as the Infinite Ikea, this extra-dimensional space more than lived up to its nickname, consisting of an Ikea store with no known limit to its endless aisles upon aisles of flat-packed Swedish furniture. But given the veritable labyrinth contained beyond the seemingly ordinary automatic doors of SCP-3008's entrance, it was rare that anyone making their way inside ever made it back out alive. On top of that, there was little the Foundation could do to ensure the safe return of anybody unlucky enough to find themselves lost in the infinite Ikea. Once inside, navigating a way out was made almost impossible given the scope of the spatially anomalous store. And then, of course, there was the staff. These tall humanoid creatures roamed the aisles of SCP-3008, sporting a lack of facial features, disproportionate bodies, and wearing the typical uniform of an average IKEA worker. I think it's becoming a concern, researcher Conley declared. No, a problem. Just how many people are going missing in SCP-3008. What else can we do? Her colleague researcher Kylan replied, shrugging their shoulders. We keep watch over the entrance and stop anyone from entering. But ours isn't the only entrance, Conley retorted. It was true. Based on evidence gathered from some survivors that had made it out of the infinite Ikea, the entrance seemed to exist in multiple parallel universes. Say we could figure out not just a way to navigate through SCP-3008 with better accuracy so people can make it back out, but what if, what if we could use it? Kylan jumped in, finishing the sentence. It could be like an interdimensional spaghetti junction, a hub to access all sorts of other alternate universes. We could send people through the entrance in our universe and they could make their way through 3008 and out into another. Exactly, their fellow researcher smiled. One problem, though, they said. What do we do about the staff? The inhabitants of the infinite Ikea were undoubtedly an obstacle standing in the path of Conley and Kylan's idea. The faceless creatures were known to be docile during the daytime cycle within SCP-3008, only to turn violent and attack anyone present when the lights dimmed. They're part of the problem, Conley mused, but what if they could be part of the solution? The SCP Foundation hadn't had much chance to examine a live instance of a staff member, known as SCP-3008-2's up close. As such, they had a limited understanding of exactly what these creatures truly were, beyond the few they had witnessed chasing survivors out of the entrance. Were they intelligent? They were apparently able to speak, if only uttering the phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building. Did they have the capacity for independent thought, free will, and emotionality? There was only one way to find out. And so Conley presented her plan to capture a member of SCP-3008 staff for closer examination, not knowing the bizarre chain of events that would unfold as a result. Drawing it out was the easy part of the plan. After all, the Foundation knew that SCP-3008-2s were able to react to the presence of human beings within the infinite Ikea. So, Conley proposed sending in a single member of D-Class personnel with a line of cable attached to them, tethering them to just outside the entrance of 3008. They were like the bait on the end of an interdimensional fishing line and would hopefully catch the attention of a staff member and lure them out. What do we do once it's out? Kylan had mused. I mean, we know so little about their biology. We could use knockout gas, but what if they don't breathe? We could tranquilize it, but what if they don't have blood? It had been the one hitch in Conley's plan, although she had suggested they use pure force, trapping the staff member like a wild animal before bringing it back. And sure enough, as an instance of SCP-3008-2 came racing out of the infinite Ikea, hot on the heels of the D-Class, Foundation security officers were able to swoop in and capture the creature, restraining it and bundling it into a transport back to the site. However, upon receiving their captive staff member, Kylan and Connolly were faced with a new problem. The creature seemed to be in its passive state. It didn't seem to be aggressive while away from SCP-3008. Kylan had posited their theory that the staff's attack state was linked somehow to the day and night cycles within the infinite Ikea, and now separated from that space, the SCP-3008-2 would remain docile, 
but the larger issue was communicating with it. As patient as Connolly tried to be with the faceless, mouthless humanoid, it seemed to be totally unresponsive to verbal communication. Any question she or her colleague Kylan asked the staff member, it offered no response. Dialing it back to more basic methods of communication, it didn't react when presented with symbols, unfazed by letters or numbers, or even straightforward pictograms. No matter what they tried, the staff member they had captured seemed not unwilling, but unable to respond. Oh, there's gotta be something we haven't tried, Conley urged, her frustration building after a long day of trying to get through to the creature. They're capable of speech, we know that from witness reports. Well, maybe they're a hive mind, Kylan mused, equally exhausted after their efforts. What if it shares a consciousness with the other staff? Like a drone in an ant colony. Hey, that's what we should name this one, they added. D for drone. Can we focus here, please? Researcher Conley snapped. It's almost like we need some way of enhancing it, granting it the right higher brain function so it has the ability to speak with us. Hold up, her colleague replied. You said we need a way to enhance it, but what if we refined it? What Kylan was insinuating was obvious, albeit a direct violation of the Foundation's own rules. SCP-914, otherwise known as the Clockworks, was an anomalous contraption of unknown origin. Two booths connected to the machine, one labeled input and the other output, could be used to disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy an object that was placed within SCP-914. Although there was yet again another hurdle Conley and Kylan would have to attempt jumping over. The Foundation had banned the use of the clockworks on biological organisms. The pair submitted a request to their Foundation superiors for access to 914 and permission to use it on D. Kylan hadn't expected their suggestion to be met with anything short of a resounding no, and while determined, Conley couldn't help but find herself worrying about the possible, highly likely rejection, which made it all the more surprising that their request was not only granted, but the experiment approved by the O5 Council themselves. Clearly, the highest operational staff within the Foundation had some keen interest in whether the Clockworks could refine an SCP-3008 staff member. More likely, their interest was in what benefit the experiment could potentially lead to. If the Foundation possessed a refined staff member, its own agent within the infinite IKEA, the possibilities could be of great advantage to the O5 Council. They were less concerned with having an intermediary, using D to communicate with the other SCP-3008-2s, or negotiating the potential release of the displaced innocent people lost inside the infinite IKEA. If refining D could mean the Council had a way to safely reach other alternate universes by traversing through SCP-3008, then that bridge between worlds would be theirs to control. Of course, Kylan and Connolly were more interested in what Refining D could tell them about the staff and the nature of SCP-3008. Did instances of SCP-3008-2 have needs or wants? Could they even possess the capacity to want things? Were they fulfilled with their lives as anomalous IKEA workers? And how did they navigate the maze of endless aisles? Imagine it, Conley theorized. If D can communicate with them for us, we could open up trade with them. The canteen inside SCP-3008 endlessly refills with food. Just picture what this could mean if we work out a system of distributing that resource out of the IKEA. It could change the world, she exclaimed excitedly. Only one way to find out, right? Kylan replied. They watched as D, their captive staff member, was nudged into the input booth of SCP-914. Conley gave the research assistants a signal to activate the clockworks, hoping that refining D would allow them to be capable of speech and free thought. However, either through miscommunication or a secret order from above, one of the assistants had incorrectly calibrated SCP-914. It was meant to be set to fine, which would improve whatever was placed in the machine, but instead the dial had been turned to very fine, which improved the target item to an ever greater extent, often granting it anomalous properties. Before anyone even noticed the change, the gears and gyros of SCP-914 clicked and whirred into life, making a raucous noise of moving mechanical parts. Destroyed in the input booth, only to be reconstituted into something altogether new in the output one opposite, D emerged from SCP-914 after the process was complete. Its clothing seemed to have experienced the most noticeable change. Instead of being the usual yellow shirt and blue trousers IKEA uniform worn by the rest of the staff, D was now sporting the same clothes, but the colors seemed to be shifting, almost like the natural camouflage of a chameleon. They were still faceless, their bodies still incorrectly proportioned compared with a human, and for the most part D seemed unchanged. But before Kylan and Connolly could move in to take a closer look, 
Before they were even able to check if D could speak, the staff member vanished in the blink of an eye. An instant state of panic erupted throughout the Foundation facility. Alarms were howling over a containment breach. Security teams were dashing through every wing of the site to track down D. Swept up in the chaos that quickly ensued, Conley and Kylan received another message from the highest point up the chain of command. Find that staff member and bring it in, alive, or there would be held to pay from the O5 Council. But somehow there was no sign of D anywhere in the facility. They had gone. Scans of the building revealed that all members of personnel, all anomalies and other registered forms of life were all accounted for. It was only when Kylan ran through the mess hall that they realized where their refined test subject had gone to. Hey, turn that up! They yelled to a security officer who had been quietly enjoying his lunch break. Standing on a chair, he reached up and raised the volume of a TV that was mounted to the wall overlooking the mess hall. The screen was depicting a live news report, the anchor on the ground standing outside the entrance to an ordinary IKEA store. I'm standing outside the very store where this bizarre turn of events have taken place, the anchor explained. Police received numerous calls regarding sightings of an unknown figure said to be scaring shoppers. However, they only responded when this clip went viral on social media. The report cut to cell phone footage of none other than D inside the store. Their uniform had shifted into its typical IKEA colors, almost like it had adapted to suit the place it had somehow transported itself to. From the mess hall, Kylan watched the footage in a mix of shock and confusion. Naturally, the reaction from bystanders was one of fright at the individual's rather odd, faceless appearance. Some took to Twitter, posting images calling it some form of viral marketing hoax. Others claimed it was a publicity stunt by IKEA to boost sales, although in a statement the company denies these accusations. However, it was then reported that the supposed creature began, I'm reading this right, aren't I? The anchor paused for a moment started helping customers by directing them to store departments, recommending different IKEA furniture, and perhaps, strangest of all, did all this via, oh, come on, really, telepathic communication. Conley had appeared in the mess hall just in time to witness the news. D had gotten free and immediately sought out the nearest IKEA to work there. The next few hours contained a maddening slew of new information bombarding the foundation as researchers Kylan and Connolly scrambled to figure out some way of recapturing D. It didn't seem that the SCP-3008-2 instance was a danger to civilians. In fact, most reports stated that they were rather friendly. Any customers that interacted with the creature described its new communication patterns in five-star reviews they apparently felt compelled to start posting online. I've never experienced anything like it, one wrote. D offered the most delightful customer service I have ever received. That's why they must have gotten their name, D for Delightful. It's not like D speaks in your head, another review explained. It's more like they just give you their thoughts beamed directly in there. I said, where can I find the bathrooms and fittings department? And instantly D had given me the directions. It was as if I'd always known. Having an anomaly like D out in the open raised all sorts of problems for the foundation. For one, they would not have to only scrub every mention of the staff member from the internet but also tracked down anyone that had interacted with D to administer amnestics. But that was far from the worst of it. The researchers had been so caught up in coordinating a recapture effort that they didn't realize how rapid and extremely widespread the D reviews were getting. They were being left on customer satisfaction boards for stores in different states within minutes of each other. It took only 15 minutes for a review that mentioned D to be left in a store that wasn't even an IKEA outlet, but a convenience store. Thank you, Dee, for such lovely and speedy service at the cashier's desk. Never had such a nice conversation and interaction with anyone else in the store before, the review read. The news that Dee could seemingly be in multiple places at once, appearing in different stores, was confirmed when Conley and Kylan saw photos posted online of the creature, wearing what looked like a number of alternate uniforms. It seemed that Dee's clothing, once exclusively just an Ikea shirt and pants, switched to match the uniform of whichever store they started to work in and the more they worked, the more places they seemed to appear. Perhaps the most shocking development came almost 50 minutes after D had been refined and had disappeared. Once again turning their attention to the news, researcher Kylan watched as the manager of a huge supermarket franchise store appeared giving an interview live, talking about how the altered SCP-3008 staff had caused him to change his entire business practice. Listen, D is great, our customers love D. I hear the company's shareholders love him too. One thing's clear, we all love D, he said jovially, but something was unnerving about his gleeful smile. 
So to show them our appreciation, I am hereby announcing that, effective immediately, all my retail staff are no longer required to come into work. D does it all, so there's no need for anyone else. They're friendlier, quieter, they work faster, and they're more efficient than any employee on my payroll. That's right, folks, D's here to stay. Naturally, this move sparks serious controversy, with the store's disgruntled now former employees finding themselves out of work. A number of them took to social media in an outcry of dissatisfaction. This isn't fair, I've worked every weekend through college at that store, and now I'm fired just like that? Thanks a lot, D, one of them protested. It's all corporate ploy, another wrote. The rumor is that the only reason they're laying us all off so quick is because D doesn't technically count as a human employee, so they don't have to pay them. They're working for free so the store manager and the company that owns the store can keep every penny of the profits. The justified outrage seemed to go willfully ignored as another store announced it would be adopting the same policy, firing all its staff and letting D take over their duties. More and more photos started pouring in right before Conley and Kylan's eyes of multiple refined SCP-3008-2 instances working behind cashier's desks, refilling shelves with products, assisting customers. These seemed to be acting out of instinct, like they couldn't help being staff. It was their purpose. The horde of anomalous staff members ended up swarming over the country's retail industry simultaneously, like the drones of an ant colony. Kylan, what the hell have we done? Connolly asked, staring in disbelief at the TV screen. We've done the unthinkable, they answered, equally horrified. We created a monster. We took D out of SCP-3008 and made them into the most powerful retail worker on the planet. Within hours, every retail outlet of every different description, not just IKEA, had reported the firing of their entire staff, and every business that did was now raking in record profits. Droves of shoppers flocked to stores, all enjoying D's customer service so much that they were taking any excuse they could to rush out and buy, well, anything. As stock supplies started to deplete, more and more instances of the altered SCP-3008-2 appeared, taking over the supply chain and distributing products to the various stores they were working at, refilling the shelves in record time. Naturally, the O5 Council was furious. Researchers Kylan and Connolly had hoped to present them with a refined SCP-3008 staff member that could allow them to better understand the infinite IKEA. Now, the Council's ulterior motive of having access to an interdimensional bridge of other universes had been dashed, as if that wasn't bad enough, and the added hassle of D rapidly becoming a worldwide sensation, the economy was destabilizing. Thanks to the retail companies firing their staff and hoarding massive amounts of profit from all their stores, and thanks to having D compulsively working there, refining an SCP-3008 staff member looked like it was about to collapse the stock market and plunge the whole world into chaos. Um, our bad? Researcher Kylan shrugged, unsure what to say after they and Connolly had just been brought before the shadowy O5 Council to be reprimanded. There was only one thing for it. D had to be taken out of the picture, and quickly. The more they worked, the more they seemed to be able to multiply and spread. Then, with a greater number of D instances within a store, the faster and more efficient they were able to work. So in retaliation, the O5 Council begrudgingly activated Mobile Task Force Alpha-1, better known by their codename, Red Right Hand. This task force reported directly to the Council. They were some of the Foundation's most loyal operatives, and it was far from their first assassination mission. Well, they had assumed it would be an assassination, dispatching the Red Right Hand to a nearby Ikea where D had first transported themselves to after exiting 914. Of course, the place was overrun with D duplicates. But even after clearing out the entire store and administering amnestics to any customers that witnessed it, there were still plenty more of D out there. The Council quickly realized that they'd have to send MTF Alpha 1 to every branch of every outlet in the country, systematically taking out every duplicate of D in a lengthy cleanup operation until they were no more. It seemed the Foundation's personnel had their work cut out for them. Hopefully, they'd be entitled to a raise and some paid time off after all of this was over. Russell's back was pressed against the wall, his shuddering hands gripping the fire axe. The low emergency lighting filling the corridor indicated the lockdown was still in effect, although that was simultaneously a blessing and a curse. Sure, it meant that thing couldn't get out, hopefully, but it also meant that Russell was stuck in the wing of the facility with it. He had no idea if anyone else was left, 
He hadn't seen what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him. Or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. There was no way of knowing for sure. It had all started so simply, so innocently, and with such noble intentions. If he had known it would lead to all this madness, Russell would have never put his name down on the request form. The SCP Foundation had been working on a way to neutralize or cure SCP-610 for what felt like forever. To one team of scientists, the infamously so-called flesh that hates was a fascinating organism. It was a highly contagious sarcic skin disease, isolated entirely within the small area of Siberia. That on its own wasn't enough to pique the interest of the research team led by Dr. Carpenter, including his hand-picked star researchers Russell and David, along with their assistant Clennon and Dr. Bodden, an expert on infectious diseases who had recently joined their efforts to provide his specialist knowledge. What did captivate all of them, however, was what SCP-610 did when it infected a human being. The disease would trigger aggressive and uncontrollable mutations within its infected and could virtually rewrite their entire physiology in a heartbeat. The flesh that hates was capable of transforming a person's body into a horrifying fleshy mass of limbs and matter that barely resembled a human being anymore. And in addition, the infected individuals would retain some level of awareness, attacking any uninfected person with extreme hostility. There had long been chatter amongst some other research teams studying SCP-610 about devising a way to weaponize the disease. If they could somehow create a variant that didn't turn people into monsters, or at least cause the fleshy abominations to die shortly after mutation, then the Foundation or another interested party could deploy the flesh that hates as a biological weapon. Dr. Carpenter had long abhorred the idea, instead searching for a way to completely reverse the effects of an SCP-610 infection. It may have been idealistic, perhaps even naive by some standards, but the rest of his team was behind him in the pursuit of that noble goal, although not one of them knew it would soon cost them their lives. Hitting speed bump after speed bump in their research, the team were beginning to lose hope. Researcher David was the most outspoken in how tired he was of seeing the same results, yelling in frustration that the flesh could not be cured by conventional means. However, it was that outburst that gave Russell the idea. They had tried treating SCP-610 like a common virus, as if it was any other form of disease, largely thanks to Dr. Botton's input. And granted, that approach had taught them a lot about the flesh's ability to contaminate a subject from a single cell. But this infection was anomalous through and through. Could the solution to eradicating it for good lie not in a medical cure, but in another SCP? Russell brought this hypothesis to the rest of the research team, and each of them had suggestions for other anomalies they could potentially use to cure a subject of the flesh that hates. We could get SCP-049 to take a look at the infected patient, Clennon suggested. Oh, it might work, Carpenter mused. Although even if he cures someone, he might also kill them. He has his whole deal about ridding the world of the pestilence could prove to be a problem. Uh, there's always 682, David said dryly. Have the reptile eat up all the SCP-610 infectees and voila, problem solved. Oh, real helpful, David, researcher Russell retorted. And what are we gonna do when SCP-682 adapts to the flesh? You really want an infected immortal lizard on the loose? Gentlemen, please. Dr. Botton spoke up. We're forgetting one obvious option. I propose we submit a joint formal request to use SCP-914 for this experiment. Unanimously, the group all agreed that this was the best course of action. SCP-914, or the Clockworks, was a giant machine with two booths marked Input and Output. Although the Foundation still couldn't fully comprehend exactly how SCP-914 seemed to take any object placed within it and disassemble, recreate, improve, or destroy the item depending on its current setting. There was one issue, however. A prior failed experiment wherein a D-Class was placed in SCP-914 had led to some pretty disastrous consequences. As a result, ever since, no organic matter was to be placed within the clockworks, a rule that the team's experiment with the flesh would breach. Still, they pressed on, each of the five researchers signing their request to utilize SCP-914 before it was submitted to the Foundation higher-ups. Within hours, the request was denied. 
but the team was determined that SCP-914 could be the key to solving the Foundation's long-standing issue with SCP-610. Dr. Carpenter repealed the decision, urging the higher-ups to reconsider. He argued that this flouting of the no organic matter rule was necessary to potentially rid the world of the flesh that hates. After a few days of consideration, the request was finally, fatefully, granted. The team went to work immediately, requisitioning two test subjects, both of which had suffered SCP-610 infections and were horribly mutated. The pair of them were deemed a potential hazard to every member of Foundation staff on site, and as a result, the entire wing of the facility where the clockworks was housed had to be evacuated for safety. Dressed in biohazard suits to protect themselves, the researchers used an electric cattle prod to coax the first flesh specimen into the input chamber of SCP-914. This was the test run. They wanted to see if the clockworks would actually be able to affect those infected with SCP-610 at all. Plus, they needed a failsafe just in case something went wrong. And luckily, the machine had just the thing. Russell asked Clement to set the clockworks to rough, and with a click and whir of its numerous gears and gyros, SCP-914 came to life. Instantly, the infected test subject was completely obliterated. The setting had reduced it to atoms, disintegrating it on such a microscopic level that there was nothing left in the output chamber. The second infected creature seemed to bristle with anger, but didn't attack or become aggressive, as it too was prodded towards the clockworks. Next, perhaps out of fear that their theory might be wrong, the team agreed to set SCP-914 to its one-to-one -one setting. Sure enough, the machine recreated another instance of a specimen infected with the flesh that hates, replacing the previous one. We all know we're stalling, researcher David piped up. Let's do what we came here for. Set the clockworks to course. Nervously receding a nod from Dr. Carpenter, Clennon stepped forward to switch the dial on SCP-914 to the course setting. This was the primary reason the team had all agreed to use the machine on a flesh specimen. This setting could disassemble any item placed in the input booth, separating it into its base components. Botten had suggested the use of SCP-914 based on the theory that, if it worked correctly, the clockworks could extract the flesh that hates from its infected host, rendering them free of the disease. The machine made a colossal amount of noise as Clennon hurried back to a safe distance with the others. But as it was powering up, seconds from activating, Dr. Carpenter noticed something. The color drained from his face as he saw it. None of the others had noticed from a distance that the dial hadn't been set to course. Instead, it pointed to very fine. The highest refinement setting 914 had. What the hell have you done?! Carpenter yelled at Clennon before the machine suddenly activated. What stepped free from the output booth stunned the researcher. It was a man, a seemingly ordinary human, who had presumably been infected by SCP-610 some time ago. He stepped nervously out of the machine, looking confused for a moment as a pair of Foundation security guards cautiously approached him. We did it, Russell said in awe. Suddenly, fleshy tendrils burst forth from the man's arms, latching on to the approaching guards. They screamed in agony, their bodies melting, become a bloody, misshapen mass that stayed attached to the humanoid creature at the center. It was like they became a part of it, the guards' arms and legs forming additional limbs as their forms were reconstituted and repurposed as part of a monster that was now crawling on its six legs towards the research team. In a blind panic, the group scrambled for the entrance, the head of the infected man splitting open down the middle, opening up into a wide, snapping pair of jaws. Panting hard as he ran, his breath fogging up the clear faceplate of the biohazard suit, Russell ran through the door, hearing someone close behind. He stopped for a moment, looking back to see the creature on the other side of the door starting to spill through the doorframe like a liquid. Running faster around a corner, Russell came to another halt in the common area. A third security guard following just before a thick, steel security door came slamming down, sealing the creature on the other side. The other door didn't hold it! What good is that going to do? Researcher David yelled. More to the point! Dr. Carpenter said, turning and marching towards Clennon. He launched a furious punch at the assistant, knocking him to the floor. Why did you set 914 to very fine, Clennon? The enraged doctor shouted. You're the one who unleashed that abomination, you maniac! What? Clennon replied, fearfully trembling. I, I didn't, I swear I didn't. It said course. I'm sure of it. You expect us to believe that was a mistake? Gentlemen, we need to focus on the situation at hand. The security officer interjected. Regardless of who's responsible, 
We need to inform the Foundation higher-ups. There's an emergency lockdown, Russell replied. It would have triggered the moment the SCP-610 specimen got free. You've trapped us with a monster, Clennon! Dr. Carpenter spat. Hold on, Researcher David spoke up. Wasn't it Botton's idea to use 914 in the first place? The common area fell silent as everyone turned to look at Dr. Botton. Did you plan for this, Doc? David pushed. Botton chuckled. Need I remind you, my friends, that we all agreed to use the clockworks, did we not? All of our names are on the request, he answered. Besides, accusing me, David, that's rather rich coming from you. What's that supposed to mean? The researcher fired back. Beckoning his finger, Botton encouraged the rest of the team to follow him across the common area, to where a row of lockers stood, each door bearing one of their names. He gestured to the one labeled David. Go on, Botton added. Shooting him a dirty look, David barged past the disease expert and opened his locker. Not one among the group expected what would fall out. It was an old leather-bound book, symbols carved into the front cover. Instantly, thanks to the work studying SCP-610, the researchers all knew a text on sarcasm when they saw one. It had been long known that the flesh that hates was often described in texts revered by sarcic cults who worship death, decay, and disease. What the hell, David? Russell exclaimed, picking up the book and examining it in disbelief. You're a sarcist? Carpenter asked, the fury in his voice already elevating. No, I'm not! Researcher David protested. I I've never seen that before! It was in your locker! The doctor yelled. You're one of those cannibal cultists! This was your plan! To refine the flesh for your twisted death-worshipping religion! It certainly seems that way, Botton interjected. After all, Researcher David did seem frustrated at our earlier results. Impatient, even. <laughs> you! David pointed at the doctor. You planted this in my locker! You're here a sarcist, Clennon repeated in a nervous stammer. You made me turn the dial to very fine. You made that thing appear. You made me your accomplice! Anger tears streamed down his face. Clennon's hand reached for the security officer's gun and went to draw it, planning to shoot David on the spot. But as he went to pull the weapon from the guard's holster, it wouldn't budge. It was then that Assistant Clennon stared in horror at his hand. His fingers had fused to the guard's leg. The officer gave a twisted grin as his torso burst open, tendrils of flesh latching onto Clennon and assimilating him. Just like it had done before, the flesh creature broke down its victim's body, making it a new part of itself, a grotesque mass of limbs and bloody matter, littered with the discarded faces of those it had infected. The research team looked at it terrified, their stomachs turning, disgusted at the growing, growling abomination of bodies fused to one another. Oh, you're beautiful. Russell heard a voice whisper behind him. He turned to see Botton, looking at the SCP-610 creature and smiling. Researcher David was the closest, and the creature lunged at him, pulling his leg out from under him. Screaming in fear, the researcher fell onto the ground and was dragged towards the flesh. It pulled him in, his body stretching, skin tearing and bones snapping as he became part of it. A new set of limbs added to the monster. Dr. Carpenter went to try and pull him free, but it was already too late. But he stepped back, knowing that if he touched it, he would be infected too. The sound of running caught Russell's attention, and he spotted Botton making a break for it. Grabbing Dr. Carpenter by the sleeve, the researcher pulled him in the same direction, partly running away from the flesh as it assimilated David, and partly chasing the sarcic saboteur. The pair of them quickly caught up to Botton, leaning over himself and panting breathlessly. Thank God you two made it, he wheezed after the run. I can't believe David could do this to unleash this nightmare upon us. Russell thought to snap at him, to scream how dare he keep lying, but Botton's back was to him now. He'd never get a better chance. There was a cabinet on the corridor wall containing a fire axe for emergencies. As carefully and quietly as he could, Russell fished the axe out of its case whilst Botton and Carpenter were looking away. We should get the Foundation to lift the lockdown, Botton was saying. They need to let us out and then- oh! Oh! He let out a blood-curdling scream mid-sentence as the axe blade wounded him. Russell pulled it back, standing over the doctor as he fell to the floor in agony. Russell, have you lost your mind? Carpenter exclaimed. No, doctor. He's the cultist. I have no idea how he tricked Clennon, but that flesh creature exists because of him, the researcher answered. From the floor, unable to move thanks to his injury, Dr. Botton began to laugh. It took me years to infiltrate the Foundation. So much time waiting to gain access to that blessed flesh, he gloated. And now you've helped me to refine it, to create its ultimate form. You want to kill me? Go ahead, Russell. My life doesn't matter. 
For once that creature is free, it will bring about a new age of flesh, and Grand Carcist Iron will reward me for the role I played in unleashing it. David was right, Carpenter realized. But you, you planted that book on him to throw us off. Doctor, we need to think of something, researcher Russell interjected, axe still in hand. Nobody knows more about the flesh that hates than us. There must be a way to kill that thing. Otherwise, if it gets out of this lockdown, it could spread to everyone in the Foundation. What about fire? That's been effective against 610 infectees before, right? Yes. Yes, but... The doctor desperately tried to think. This new being we've created. He created. Russell argued, looking at the grimacing, wounded Botan. We cannot deny the role we've all played in this researcher, Carpenter argued. And we have no idea if it possesses the same weaknesses as the flesh before its refinement. But we have to try, sir! The researcher protested. Of course, I agree. The sickening sound of a slithering, slick mass was rapidly approaching. Still laying on the floor in pain, Dr. Botton had been dragged to the middle of a junction, with Carpenter and Russell hiding around either corner. Suddenly, Botton started hollering as the flesh came into view, practically calling it to him. Oh, look at you! He exclaimed. You're better than I could have ever hoped for! Looking down at him with the faces it had collected, the creature stabbed one of its disgusting appendages through Botton, drawing its body into its growing form. I am honored to give my life so that the age of flesh may begin, the doctor said weakly, through the pain as he was infected. From around the corner, Carpenter had taken the sarcic text and set its pages on fire with a cigarette lighter. Turning to the creature, he hurled the mass of burning paper at it, hoping it would be enough fire to spread to the flesh while it was assimilating Botton, who they had left there as bait. The fiery book collided with the monstrosity. As Russell peeked around the corner, he saw the flesh retreating from the flames. Botton's body now added to it. For a moment, it seemed like the creature was afraid of the fire, but slowly it drew nearer and nearer to the book. With ease, it stamped down the flames with Botton's leg, dousing the fire and suffering no damage to it at all. Gripping the axe in his hands, Russell went to charge at the creature, only to feel something push him back. Dr. Carpenter had stopped him. RUN! He yelled. Instantly, Russell turned and raced down the corridor, the sound of fleshy tentacles whipping through the air. He dared not look back, just in case the monster was right behind him. Eventually, he reached another corner and slammed his back against it, hands shuddering as he held on to the fire axe. He had no idea what had happened to Carpenter. Maybe it got him, or perhaps he had managed to give it the slip at the last second. Russell! Came a hushed voice from around the corner, one the researcher recognized. He turned to see Dr. Carpenter approaching him, sneaking like he was trying to avoid being heard. I think I've managed to give it the slip, the doctor whispered. For a second, Russell backed up, his hands tightening around the axe handle. This might have looked like Dr. Carpenter, but was it? Are you really you, doctor? He asked. Of course I am, Carpenter replied. You don't think that... I'm not that monstrosity. Russell raised the axe defensively, only to notice the sadness in the doctor's face. Unable to bring himself to swing, even to find out, the researcher lowered his weapon. Carpenter looked grateful. Come on, let's get them to lift this lockdown, he said. I'm sure an MTF can step in and take care of our mistake. As the pair of them cautiously made their way towards one of the locked doors, Dr. Carpenter reached out a hand to place it on Russell's shoulder. It was quiet. Too quiet. That had been what everyone remembered about that day. Ask any member of personnel who was working what the one thing they recalled before it happened. They'd all tell you the same, that it had been too quiet. An eerie lull in the Foundation's usual day-to-day -day activity, followed by untold, unspeakable chaos. But the quiet had come first, and within that quiet, a madman was hiding. His name was Vince Barrett, at least that was his legal name, but he much preferred to go by his online moniker of the Tainted Lizard, or just the Zard for short. Anyone who chooses to call themselves something like that in an attempt to sound cool might well be a person to avoid. And in Vince, sorry, the Zard's case, that sentiment was accurate. He was a social recluse, devoting a lot of his time to some of the darker corners of the internet, and we don't just mean that he spent his days trawling through Reddit. No, the Zard's interests were in the paranormal, the unusual and inexplicable, as well as the community of his fellow internet recluses dedicated to unearthing the true supernatural horrors of the world. Eventually spending so much time in corners of the online world where few normal people would dare to tread, that would lead to Zard becoming a member of the prolific forum known as Parawatch. 
This was the real deal. Not just urban legends and blurry photos of Bigfoot or faked handheld videos of people falling into the back rooms. Parawatch had long been known to and kept under the surveillance of the SCP Foundation. Why? Well, because this infamous online message board would occasionally feature posts about anomalies. Some even including SCPs and leaked information about the Foundation themselves. Of course, hardly any of these posts stayed up for very long before the Foundation's tech team scrubbed them permanently. But it was here on the Parawatch forum where Vince Barrett would encounter a fateful video clip. Acting fast, he managed to save the file before it was taken down. It was footage taken from the body cam of a Foundation security officer during the midst of a containment breach. The Zard hit play, his hand shaking with excitement. The original poster of the clip to Parawatch had said that this footage was perhaps the only known video on the entire internet that depicted something known as SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. Of course, those familiar with 682 and the SCP Foundation will need no introduction, but Vince, on the other hand, had only ever heard rumors about this creature. And now, in the video playing on his computer screen, he was seeing it for the first time. The reptile was free from its containment chamber, tearing its way through a Foundation facility and making quick work of dispatching the security personnel that dared to stand in its way. It was a force of unbridled carnage and rage, destroying anything in its path and adapting to its environment. Deep in the Parawatch forum, the Zard had read rumors and leaks from alleged ex-Foundation staff and detractors that 682 was like something out of a nightmare. They said that the creature could adapt perfectly in response to damage inflicted upon it, or to changes in its environment, as well as heal any injury it sustained. It persisted, it kept on going, and something about that enamored Vince to the infamous anomaly. He thought it was beautiful, the ultimate apex predator, and admired the hard-to-destroy reptile's tenacity, as well as its ferocity. Watching the horrific containment breach footage, he realized then and there that he was a devoted fanatic of SCP-682. His time on the dark side of the web had twisted his mind and led him to make one fateful decision that he needed to see the creature in person. That had been almost a year earlier, and in the time since, the tainted lizard had pulled on every dark web string he knew of, eventually getting in contact with a shady group called the Chaos Insurgency. Vince had managed to get a hold of a real-life SCP Foundation keycard, as well as the location of the facility they were holding 682 in, and a forged transfer document. Posing as a humble, unassuming janitor, the Zard had made his way inside the Foundation, and wasted no time in making a beeline straight for the acid tank where 682 was held. He stared at the creature through the glass, eyes wide and jaws slacked in utter awe of the monstrous reptile. Perhaps the biggest fan of SCP-682 on the planet couldn't quite believe he was standing in the presence of the creature itself. It barely seemed to pay him any mind from the other side of the tank, the acid surrounding it melting 682 as fast as it could heal. Seeing it in containment enraged Vince. He hated that the Foundation had kept what he viewed as a perfect organism locked up after having tried time and time again to destroy it. Don't worry. The Zard murmured, approaching the tank well over the minimum safe distance. You're a force of unparalleled destruction, and you don't deserve to be here. I'm gonna set you free. Unfortunately, after the glass had been smashed and the alarm screamed out that another containment breach was occurring, Vince would quickly find out that the reptilian beast he revered so highly didn't quite hold him in the same regard. If you thought the Zard was going to make it all the way through the story alive, well, then we regret to inform you that you're sorely mistaken. Although not as woefully misguided as Vince himself, who was the first person in the path of SCP-682 when he freed the creature. What all those leaks and rumors on Parawatch had failed to mention about the heart to destroy reptile was its vehement and relentless hatred for all other forms of life including its very own fan. And the Tainted Lizard was only the first casualty of SCP-682's latest rampage. But this time was different. Sure, 682 was easily tearing its way through SCP Foundation personnel left and right. Security teams were flung aside and ripped to shreds as they tried in vain to recontain the monster. Research staff found themselves tripping over each other, trying to rush out of the destructive path of the hard-to-destroy reptile only to find themselves the next to face its ferocious attack. In other words, 
It seemed to mostly be another unbridled slaughter, common fare for an SCP-682 containment breach, except rather than breaking its way out of the facility. This particular instance saw the creature heading in the direction of another anomaly, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. Now, if a rampaging regenerative reptile on the loose wasn't enough cause for concern, then seeing it moving along its trajectory to another anomalous refinement machine certainly was. Those that had been on the other side of the facility when the dearly departed Zard set 682 free were now looking on in horror as the hard-to-destroy reptile burst into the room housing SCP-914. The Foundation staff, in the midst of panic, stared at security monitors with bated breath, palpable fear hanging in the air. Each and every one of them knew that SCP-682 was more than just a mindless beast. The creature was fiercely, frighteningly intelligent, sentient even. And as it approached the controls for the clockworks, every onlooker secretly hoped something or someone would step in at the last second and prevent SCP-682 from entering the machine. Unfortunately, that's not what happened. SCP-914 whirred into life its gears and gyro spinning as SCP-682 entered the input booth. Now, normally, the way the clockworks operates is by destroying any item placed within it and replacing it with something else in the output booth. Depending on its setting, it either completely disintegrates an item, breaks down an object into its base components, replaces it with an equivalent, or improves it. And being set to very fine as it was right now, SCP-914 can even add anomalous properties to whatever is put inside of it. But what happens when an indestructible and infinitely adaptable monstrosity is in the clockworks? Well, it can't destroy and recreate a better version of something that would be known for being hard to destroy, can it? The entire machine was going haywire. SCP-682 was adapting to the refinement process, refusing to let SCP-914 unmake it, even to replace it with an improved version of itself. The hard-to-destroy reptile and the clockworks were at a momentary stalemate and watched with bated breath by the Foundation. SCP-914 began to malfunction, its clockwork components getting stuck as if the machine was jammed. Its cogs were clogged up, unable to destroy the subject in the input booth. The room around was beginning to shake. In fact, the very ground was trembling at the force of the whole machine shuddering. Enact the Abandon All Hope Protocol, the head of research said desperately, watching the events unfold from the other side of the building. The site director looked at them and nodded, the pair of them entering their secure passcodes to activate this secretive security measure. Just as they did, a small earthquake erupted underfoot. The entire wing of the facility housing the clockworks and SCP-682 had collapsed into the ground. A huge crater was all that remained, littered with wreckage of a whole portion of the Foundation site, along with broken pieces of SCP-914. For the next few minutes, everyone was on edge, secretly hoping that SCP-682 hadn't survived. Maybe the clockworks had managed to destroy it, but the sheer force of doing so had caused the machine to collapse in on itself. Or perhaps the hard-to-destroy reptile was now buried beneath several thousand tons of debris, dead at long last. But the Foundation staff knew better than to get their hopes up. And sure enough, just as an armed security team approached the crater, something started stirring in the rubble. Suddenly, SCP-682 came bursting out of the crater, emerging in not quite the same state although no less deadly than before. The clockworks hadn't been able to unmake the hard-to-destroy reptile, but the resultant malfunction and explosion had imbued the creature with a whole host of new anomalous abilities. It still resembled its old self, but was now more humanoid, standing bipedal instead of on all fours. Some of its body mass had seemingly been reduced due to damage sustained in the malfunction, although SCP-682 was still plenty of feet taller than an ordinary human being. In fact, it could be any height it needed to be. The creature's scaly skin seemed to be shifting unnaturally, moving of its own accord, like it was already preparing to adapt to oncoming damage. And as the nearby security team were about to find out, this made it even deadlier than before. In a panic, the Foundation officers opened fire, only to find that their weapons weren't operating the way they should. Something caused excitation of the copper shells of their bullets, making them either expand and block the barrels of their guns, or causing them to backfire horribly, injuring the security personnel wielding them. Before anybody could even call in air support or heavy artillery as a backup, 
a number of the Foundation's most powerful weapons suffered even more catastrophic misfires. Missiles detonated early. They hadn't even been aimed at SCP-682 yet, but they would have been. Instead, they exploded, taking with them a huge number of Foundation entities, some miles away from where the newly refined reptile now stood. SCP-682's regenerative powers had been altered by the clockworks. It wasn't purely reactive to oncoming damage now, it was preemptive. It could adapt to attacks that hadn't even happened yet. With no way of stopping it, SCP-682 began decimating everything in its path with greater ferocity than ever. Over the coming days, the newly dubbed Impossible to Destroy Reptile began its biggest rampage yet, entering a permanent rage state and unleashing destruction on a global scale. It stormed through cities and wiped out entire major population centers in moments. It seemed nothing on Earth could stand against the refined reptile, fueled by its singular mission to wipe out all life in existence. The surviving personnel of the SCP Foundation soon came to learn that no damage could be inflicted on the creature whatsoever. SCP-682 could predict attacks ahead of the person that would carry it out, and then adapt, changing the very world around it so that attack never came. The impossible to destroy reptile's adaptations usually took the form of diverting any oncoming damage it preempted it would take, and instead inflicted that same damage on whoever it chose. Even though the machine had malfunctioned, the clockworks had made SCP-682 that good at adapting to its surroundings that the creature had almost become a universal constant. The fact that it could not be harmed now seemed to be as fundamental of a law as that of gravity, but that wasn't going to stop the SCP Foundation from trying. The number of casualties the world over had been increasing steadily day by day, as SCP-682 continued its devastating campaign of slaughter. Some of the remaining scraps of the Foundation had tried to subdue the creature, but any attempts at fighting it with conventional weapons were ill-advised, to say the least. After all, how do you fight against a creature that can predict your every move and counter them before you've even thought of those moves? Well, you can try throwing something so unexpected at it. At least pulling something out of left field means that the chances of SCP-682 seeing it coming are slightly slimmer. And that was where the Abandon All Hope Protocol came in. You see, the Foundation had been anticipating that 682 would one day become too powerful to contain long before the creature had gained its new ability to preemptively adapt. And while the worldwide death toll had climbed from hundreds of thousands of innocent people to the earliest millions, an unlikely counterattack was brewing. One so unexpected that even the impossible to destroy reptile would struggle to see it coming. Just as humanity was facing the brink of extinction, the Foundation dispatched their last hope at stopping SCP-682, other SCPs. The Abandon All Hope protocol had been devised for when the suffering and destruction caused by SCP-682 became so great that there were no other options left. When it had been activated, Foundation agents stationed at various sites across the world had gathered a specially selected group of anomalies. Each one was chosen because they were known to be sympathetic towards humanity, or at least be coerced into taking on SCP-682. And now, these SCPs were stepping up to the plate, ready to fight the impossible to destroy reptile, or more likely, to die trying. SCP-076-2, the immortal warrior known as Abel, was infamous for picking fights. The ancient Sumerian swordsman had a penchant for seeking out the most challenging adversaries, so convincing him to take a crack at SCP-682 wasn't all that difficult. However, rushing into battle against the refined reptile, Abel quickly found he couldn't draw his weapons from his pocket dimension. They were dissipating the moment his fingers touched them, vanishing faster than he could draw. No matter, the warrior thought. He'd been alive for centuries and thus had become a master in every form of hand-to-hand -hand combat. As you can imagine, he didn't last very long, left to slowly revive inside his stone tomb after SCP-682 had finished dispatching him. Abel's brother Kane incurred a slightly different result when he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the impossible to destroy reptile. SCP-073 was hardly the fighter his brother was, but had the anomalous trait of reflecting incoming damage back at whoever was inflicting it on him. So when SCP-682 attacked Kane, theoretically the same attack would have bounced back and harmed the reptile itself. And before, that's what would have happened. 
but now SCP-682 could adapt preemptively. A strange, never-before-seen phenomenon occurred. It appeared that neither SCP-073 nor the refined reptile were harming each other at all. However, on a metaphysical level, the potential damage of 682's attacks against Kane were being reflected back towards the reptile, only for the creature to preemptively adapt to the damage from its own attack being inflicted back. What resulted was a feedback loop of perpetual possible damage that ended only when Kane eventually passed out from shock. Unfortunately, while he could reflect damage back at an attacker, he felt the pain of every hit, and SCP-682 had more than just a mean right hook. The Foundation had hoped, given its 100% mortality record, that SCP-096 would have no trouble killing the impossible-to-destroy reptile, or at the very least, harming it enough so that it could be subdued. After all, 682 still needed to see, and anyone looking at the Shy Guy quickly met their end. But when the tall, pale humanoid approached SCP-682, something unusual happened. The reptile could look at SCP-096, able to see it perfectly. Perhaps the creature's adaptive properties were creating an intentional blind spot in its vision, removing SCP-096 from view. Or maybe 682 no longer saw with just eyes, perceiving the world in a manner far beyond our understanding of basic sight. But whatever the case, the impossible to destroy reptile made SCP-096 turn and flee in terror. Compelled to put an end to the reptile's reign of terror, SCP-4494, the Spectre, manifested nearby and tried to intervene. The result was nothing short of brutal, a one-sided fight that not even the living embodiment of crime fighting could hope to win. After SCP-682 had finished off the Spectre, a strange black fluid began oozing from nearby. Although one of the hardest to wrangle, the Foundation believed that they had convinced SCP-106 to aid in taking down SCP-682. The old man emerged from the oily secretion, shuffling menacingly towards the impossible-to-destroy reptile. It seemed to freeze, as if it was taking a defensive stance against the old man, either that or tricking him into getting closer. Before he could even reach out a decrepit hand to touch the reptile's shifting skin, SCP-106 was suddenly coated in copious amounts of the black substance he secreted. It coated him like thick tar. The more his decaying body produced, the more he was covered in it. Normally, he was resistant to the corrosive burning effects of this substance. However, SCP-682's preemptive adaptation powers had caused SCP-106 to overproduce the oily substance, enough to rapidly dissolve the old man into a steaming black puddle. It was at this point that SCP-343, colloquially known as God, lowered his newspaper and looked out of his window. That is to say, he looked out of the huge hole that had been left in the wall of his cell. Being omniscient, SCP-343 was already burdened with the awareness of what had happened. SCP-682 had been refined into an even worse version of itself by the clockworks. Up until now, God had been happy to avoid all the fighting and just see how everything worked out. But as much as he tried to distract himself, SCP-682 slaughtering other SCPs in droves was getting in the way of his reading. Oh, this again. In a split second, the entire universe had been unmade and then remade almost exactly the same. Except SCP-343 had made a slight adjustment, giving a little nudge to cause an effect in a few places. As a result, a certain misguided forum user had never and would never infiltrate the Foundation and break SCP-682 free, leading to the hard-to-destroy reptile being refined by the clockworks. Although, while it had been unceremoniously returned to its original form and placed back in its acid tank, SCP-682 could still remember the power it had wielded only moments before everything had been rewritten. All it needed was another chance to get into the clockworks. Bodies all over the ground, necks twisted, faces contorted in terror. SCP-173, not one, but an army, scatters out through Site-19, massacring researchers one broken neck at a time. Pure chaos. How could this possibly have happened? The strobing of the blood-red emergency lighting was already fear-inducing enough, so it was being hidden under one of the tables in the mess hall, trembling as the noise of alarms rang out through the facility. But the thing about the flickering lights scared SCP Foundation researcher Mira Smithy all the more, for the few seconds of darkness that came between each flash of red. 
If it had been any other containment breach, she probably wouldn't have even noticed. For in those few seconds, when the warning light lit up only to cut out, she couldn't see a thing, and her not being able to see made it easier for them to move around. Mira had lost track of time since the alarms had first sounded to mark the containment breach. She tried to keep count of the minutes, but the drumming of her heartbeat had thrown her off. There was no way of knowing if it had been hours or only a few minutes since everything went wrong. Of course, the SCP Foundation had plenty of procedures and protocols in place to prevent or respond to situations like this. Yet the emergency alarms kept echoing through the corridors, lights plunging the facility into darkness every few seconds, only to break it up with a brief flash of red. It seemed to Mira from her hiding spot that this breach had proven far too much for the Foundation's extensive procedures to counteract. Maybe it was all over already, she thought after a few seconds or maybe minutes under the table. What if they had gotten bored, tired of slaughtering their way through Foundation personnel and slunk back to their containment chamber? That would have been simpler, far less terrifying than the alternative that came creeping into Mira's head in the form of her next thought. What if she was the only one left alive, the last member of site personnel still breathing, just by some random hundred to one chance? And if that was the case, how long would it take for them to find her? How many even were there? A new sound, just detectable below the alarms, broke through her avalanche of anxious questions. Footsteps. The noise of boots clomping against the floor clearly belonging to a human and not one of them. Cautious as to which way her gaze was directed, Mira poked her head from out beneath the table, glancing around during the few seconds where the red of the emergency lights allowed her to see. The steps were getting closer, and as they did, Researcher Smithy realized something that made her fearful for her fellow survivor. They were running away, and there was no way they could do that while also looking back at what was coming after them. Over here! She hissed in a hushed tone at the sight of a pair of legs crossing a nearby corridor. Their thick, standard-issue military boots seemed to match those worn by the Foundation's security personnel. The officer passed by, only to stop and tiptoe closer to the mess hall, having heard Mira's whispered call. With the red lights blinking, it looked like every other step the security officer took had been edited out, like they were teleporting closer in the dark. Watching intently from her hiding place, it reminded Mira sickeningly of the things she was hiding from, how they moved, and the worrying fact that she couldn't see one following the security officer. Hello? Hello? called the man's voice as he entered the mess hall. Under the table, Mira whispered. If we hide, we can still see them, but they can't see us. Hiding? He replied. No, we need something that can revert these things back to the original. Uh, it was so much easier to handle when there was just one of them. Look, let's make a break for it. I'm going to grab SCP-3108 and get the lights back on. If we can restore visibility, we might be able to stand a fighting chance against those things. The officer was looking around the cafeteria trying to locate the source of Researcher Smithy's voice, eyes distracted. Then the intermittent flickering of red light cut off again, plunging the entire mess hall into near pitch darkness. At the same time, there was the sound of something heavy and stone scraping against the flooring. It turned Mira's stomach, and she immediately covered her mouth. She had no idea if they could hear her breathing. Could a creature of stone even detect sound at all? While the lights were down and the security guard's back was turned, a pair of sculptures, built from concrete and rebar, traces of spray paint over their stone skin, appeared behind the officer at impossible speed. There was a sickening crunch, followed by the sound of something dropping to the floor of the mess hall. As the emergency lights flicked back on, Mira could see them, the two copies of SCP-173 standing still next to the table she was under, bathed in red light. This nightmare had all begun as an otherwise ordinary Friday for the SCP Foundation. Only a few hours earlier, Mira had been brainstorming her latest pitch for a series of experiments involving SCP-914. Otherwise known as the Clockworks, SCP-914 was a large machine comprised of various cogs, gyros, and gears of unknown origin. Its function, however, had long been documented and was of great interest to the Foundation. Any object placed within SCP-914's input booth could be transformed, destroyed, or improved depending on the clockworks' setting. Rough would disintegrate the subject, coarse would dismantle it to its base components, and one-to-one -one would merely replace the object with a similar, almost identical one. Then there were the fine and very fine settings, 
The former would cause SCP-914 to improve any item, and the later is capable of the same but with one key difference. Very fine would refine an object even more, usually by giving it anomalous properties. The Foundation higher-ups had permitted staff to freely conduct tests using the clockworks, although approval was required, and all data was to be recorded. While many of the scientists at the Foundation were fixed on the mysterious origin of SCP-914, or the furthest extent of its refinement capabilities, Myra had been thinking about it in a far more practical way. She wasn't interested in the how or the why of SCP-914's inner workings, nor who had built it. Her experiments were born out of considering better usages for the clockworks. It was a machine that could provide endless possibilities, and Myra was determined to make it to the fullest use of it in order to solve actual real-world problems. Imagine for a moment. She announced, reading off her cue cards as she practiced pitching her experiment to the Foundation's senior researchers. Imagine a world where nobody ever gets sick, where human beings are able to live long, healthy, and prosperous lives. Uh, maybe dial back on the Star Trek. Her colleague, research assistant Jensen, interjected. Really? That's what you call constructive criticism? She retorted before continuing. If we apply the transformative refinement powers of SCP-914, that world could be the future that awaits us. For example, I'm proposing tests that involve placing man-made chemical compounds like painkillers, heart medication, and other potentially life-saving medicines through the clockwork's refinement process. I'm not suggesting we need to set it to very fine and create anomalous versions of these things, but what if, even on the fine setting, we're able to improve the effectiveness of our existing treatments for all kinds of afflictions? Jensen raised their hand, patiently waiting to comment like a child in a classroom. What? A uh, few things, they replied, lowering their hand. First off, some if not all man-made medications include some kind of organic component. The O5 Council have banned all- Yes, I'm fully aware of the containment procedures, Mira interrupted them. That's exactly why I'm trying to convince the Council, or hell, just even Dr. Bright, to let me step around. I genuinely believe we could be doing so much more with SCP-914, and I need them to see that. Look, I'm not here to rain on your parade, Smithy her assistant reassured. I'm only bringing up concerns that anyone will have about this proposal. You talked about wanting to improve our existing medical treatments, which is noble, don't get me wrong, but have you considered the wider effect that might have? If you make everyone on Earth more resistant or even immune to everything, then diseases are going to evolve. What if we end up with a form of superbacteria resistant to all forms of medication, even if that medicine's been refined in SCP-914? Trying to save the world might just bring about its end. I've thought about that, but if the Council starts allowing for biological testing again, then the solution is obvious. We use the clockworks to eradicate whatever germs or diseases are able to develop after improving treatment options," Myra explained, then adding, Besides, that can't be any more dangerous than what we've been using SCP-914 for. I mean, enhancing other SCPs, that's a recipe for disaster. Got to agree with you there, Jensen sighed. Even without placing them in the clockworks, the Foundation's been way too cavalier with the dangerous ones. Speaking of, you know what tonight is, Smithy replied with a confused look. Date night, they stated. Elsewhere in the facility, unknown to researcher Smithy at that time, one of the dangerous SCPs Jensen had mentioned had been let out of containment. This was a regular occurrence, even if it was considered a little unorthodox to some. In fact, the only reason that the O5 Council so often turned a blind eye to it was because of the researcher it involved, Dr. Alto Clef. It seemed Clef had a certain fondness for SCP-173, the sculpture, a living statue constructed from concrete and rebar that could travel at impossible speeds whenever it was unobserved. Most Friday nights, Clef would have romantic candlelit dinners with SCP-173, putting a dress and blonde wig on the sculpture and treating it like his beloved partner. The whole while watched by Dr. Clef and a group of D-class acting as waiters and cooks, SCP-173 would stand motionless while the bizarre date went on late into the night. It was no secret that the sculpture was a highly aggressive creature, with a penchant for snapping the neck of the nearest person the moment that they blinked. However, it was only because of Dr. Clef's reputation and track record for the elimination of anomalies that he was granted the special privilege of whining and dining with SCP-173. This time though, partway through their regularly scheduled date, Dr. Clef was called away to deal with matters relating to another anomaly he'd been charged with decommissioning. The pair of D-Class waiting on the doctor and his date were instructed to wait, keep a close eye on SCP-173, alerting each other in case they needed to blink. 
It was a hell of a gamble, a risk that could have been avoided if the sculpture had been transported back to its secure containment chamber. But Dr. Clef could be persuasive. That is to say, he threatened both D-Class waiters with a bludgeoning from his ukulele if they didn't do as he asked. Both the D-Classes stared directly at the sculpture, each one feeling the anxious beads of sweat slowly crawling down their foreheads, worried that they'd both blink at the same time by accident. They announced their need to refresh their eyes every so often, alternating between being the watcher and the one allowed to blink, all the while as CP-173 was motionless. Perhaps it was patiently waiting for Dr. Clef to return, or for one of the D-Class watching to slip up. As if through some cruel twist of fate, a fly began to buzz through the air, drifting towards the D-Class with their eyes on SCP-173. It looped and darted around, its wings making an annoying droning. One of the waiters announced he needed to blink again, and the other told him he was free to do so while he kept watch over the sculpture. At the exact same moment that one man blinked, the fly zipped its way towards the second D-Class, distracting him again and drawing his gaze for a little more than a millisecond. That fly whizzing past was the last thing he saw, as SCP-173 darted forward. It moved with such incredible speed that it was imperceptible, grabbing the nearby D-Class, the one who'd spotted the fly, and killing him instantly before the other could even open his eyes. When he did, SCP-173 had vanished from its spot at the date night table, nowhere to be seen. Before the remaining D-Class could realize it was behind him, SCP-173 had made short work of its other observer. It began zipping unseen through the corridors of the SCP Foundation facility. Dr. Clef had returned to his date only to find the two D-Class waiters dead, and SCP-173 missing. Immediately, he had raised the alarm, meaning that research staff were too busy fleeing to safely pay any attention to the sculpture quickly making its way through the site. Swept up in the evacuation, half deafened by the alarms, in all the commotion, researcher Myra Smithy hadn't even realized she'd left the door to the clockworks wide open. Shuffling down a corridor with her fellow researchers, the lights suddenly went out. A few nearby screamed in panic at having been unceremoniously thrust into the dark. Myra blindly reached for Jensen's hand, only to hear the sounds of multiple heavy concrete feet dragging along the floor. Suddenly, the emergency lights blinked. She turned, and to her horror, she saw SCP-173 with its stony arms around Jensen's neck, their face stricken with sheer terror, tears in their eyes. But now, Myra quickly realized, as the corridor was filled with shrieks of fear from the other researchers, that there was more than one sculpture now. Myra barely managed to escape with her life in all the confusion, crawling out of the low-lit corridor on her hands and knees, while the multiple new SCP-173 instances slaughtered anyone that couldn't see them. Since then, she had been hiding, hearing the scraping steps of the sculptures traveling around the facility unobserved. They had attacked the fuse boxes first, as if in a calculated tactical move, take out the lights, and suddenly everyone found it much harder to see them. Even through the fear, it was hard for Mira not to blame herself for all the chaos. She couldn't remember whether she'd left the door to SCP-914 open or not, but it hadn't taken her long to figure out that the clockworks had something to do with this madness. Somehow, SCP-173 had made its way there, had been able to operate the machinery while the Foundation staff were distracted by their own evacuation. Presumably, with SCP-914 set to very fine, the sculpture had been transformed into its ultimate refined form, or multiple forms, it seemed. There was a veritable horde of SCP-173s running amok through the facility. It made sense, Myra reasoned, in some twisted, cruel, anomalous way. The sculpture had only ever been a danger when unobserved. The second anyone took their eyes off of it, so much as blinked, it would strike. How does a machine like SCP-914 improve upon that? Easy. It gives the sculpture the power to replicate itself. Anyone can look at multiple things at once, of course, but nobody can look at everything simultaneously. Even if someone was watching a pair or three SCP-173s, one more could easily slip up behind them for the kill. Still hidden under the table, Myra's eyes were locked on the pair of sculptures in the mess hall, the body of the security officer out of focus in her peripheral vision. She dared not look away, frozen in sheer fear that the second she blinked, they would lift up the table and find her. She had been so overwhelmed, so paralyzed with her terror, that she had forgotten about the lights. As the emergency lighting flickered again, the sculptures both moved, shifting across the mess hall as the room went dark, only to stop in place the second Myra could see them again. They hadn't gotten closer, 
In fact, both looked to be leaving. The only thing keeping them here was her. She was watching them, and it had frozen them in place. Their greatest strength, the imperceptible movement and speed of SCP-173 was offset by an indisputable weakness of their anomalous biology. They couldn't stop someone from looking at them, and couldn't stop themselves becoming still, solid concrete when they were being watched. Mulling over her options, Myra decided to follow through with the plan from the fallen security guard, to retrieve SCP-3108 and try to undo what the clockworks had done. Slowly, she slipped out from under the table, keeping both eyes on the pair of sculptures, keeping them lashed to one spot as she gradually backed out of the mess hall. The lights went out and plunged the area into darkness again, and researcher Smithy could hear the heavy concrete scraping of the two sculptures looking for her as she blindly made her way through the facility. She managed to evade the roaming stone creatures, resisting her natural instinct to hide and looking directly at any she encountered on the way, making sure to stay out of their view. If she saw them, she'd freeze them. If they saw her, they'd chase her. Eventually, fishing SCP-3108 out of a containment box, Myra held the weapon in her hand. It was a heavily modified Nerf gun, which she loaded a foam dart into and pulled the plastic slide back. The creatively named Nerfing Gun had almost the opposite effect of SCP-914. Instead of improving something, SCP-3108 turned whatever was shot with it into an inferior equivalent object something worse than itself. It just might work. Drawing the gun as she heard the sound of scraping concrete getting nearer and nearer, Myra turned the corner coming face to face with one of the sculptures. She held the gun high, closing the gap between them, making sure she didn't miss, but wary she needed to fire before the lights blinked off again. She squeezed the plastic trigger, sending the foam darts shooting out of the barrel of the nerfing gun. The flimsy projectile collided with the SCP-173 instance, bouncing off its head and landing on the floor. For a split second, the lights dimmed again, then came back on. Myra's heart had lurched in her chest, only to see that the sculpture hadn't moved at all. She leaned closer to it, blinking intentionally. It still didn't move. It was rooted to the ground, fixed. Just a statue, rendered powerless by the nerfing gun. Excitedly, Myra knelt down and scrabbled on the floor to retrieve the dart, just as the emergency lighting flickered out again. In her excitement, Myra was too focused on reloading SCP-3108, that is, until she heard the shuffling of concrete and rebar behind her. The lights were still out and she fumbled blindly for the foam dart. As the noise got closer and closer, her fingertips brushed the projectile, knocking it further away, when suddenly the lights came back up. But as she reached for it, researcher Smithy felt a large, cold presence behind her, something huge and heavy, and made of stone and lingering at the very corner of her eye. Before she could turn around and face it, something grabbed Myra, and a sickening snap rang out through the corridor. Fearless, relentless, and one of the most utterly brutal warriors to ever walk the face of the earth, with a body count somewhere in the high hundred thousands, if not well into multiple millions, given just how long he's been around for. Many of you will already be well aware of SCP-076-2, also known as Abel. On the surface, he's a man of Middle Eastern descent, covered in tattoos of occult symbols and demonic faces, usually contained within a stone cube designated SCP-076-1. Abel will often emerge in a homicidal state, killing anyone and anything directly around him. How? Well, by any means available to him, but primarily by pulling a wide array of bladed weapons seemingly out of thin air. This is thanks to a tiny pocket dimension that only he can reach into, which is also always stocked with an assortment of deadly implements for his latest murder spree. As if being highly combat proficient and always armed didn't make him enough of an imposing threat, SCP-076-2 also possesses a near superhuman resistance to damage, making him incredibly difficult to take down. And even if someone is able to eventually neutralize him, Abel will also come back resurrecting inside SCP-076-1 to fight another day. What you may not know is, for a time, Abel actually worked alongside the SCP Foundation, although nowadays they prefer to keep him locked away in a secure containment facility underwater, which they will flood with seawater if he ever escapes. But Abel was once appointed the leader of his own mobile task force, Omega-7, referred to under the codename of Pandora's Box. 
You see, the Foundation realized that SCP-076-2 held an especially high regard for those who proved, well, able to best him in combat. And it was this strange code of honor that Abel held that the Foundation hoped to exploit with the creation of Pandora's Box. Comprised of MTF operatives that had earned Abel's respect, most by previously beating him in a fair fight, or as fair as a fight with a man who can summon swords through a tear in the fabric of reality can be. These agents would support Abel during missions in the field, during which the SCP Foundation were able to deploy the anomalous warrior in various tactical engagements. However, this didn't last long. Eventually, Abel grew tired of carrying out the orders of the Foundation. The immortal warrior craved a challenge, breaking free of containment and turning on the Foundation, resulting in Abel being neutralized by an on-site nuclear weapon. This marked the end of the fragile alliance between SCP-076-2 and the SCP Foundation, leaving the existence of Omega-7 a classified secret and one of the organization's most embarrassing missteps. Well, but what if that hadn't happened? What if out there in the infinite multiverse, there was a world where Abel had been allowed to remain a part of Omega-7 and the mobile task force was never disbanded? Well, you're about to find out. In our world, Abel's dissatisfaction with being a member of Pandora's Box first became apparent when he began putting the rest of his unit through live fire exercises, brutalizing his men despite these exercises being intended as for training purposes only. But in this world, the injuries and even casualties Abel inflicted on the rest of Omega-7 were met with a much different response. The O5 Council of this alternate version of the SCP Foundation viewed Abel's outbursts during training as acceptable losses. Every time he would injure one of Omega-7, the Council would demand that replacements be on hand to become part of the task force, drawn from the ranks of the other MTFs at their disposal. After all, Abel was a valuable asset for carrying out the Foundation's dirty work. By continually replenishing his team with reserves from their seemingly inexhaustible supply of other MTF agents, the O5 Council of this world were able to keep SCP-076-2 firmly under their employ. However, it is also important to note that Abel's patience for these new recruits was far more limited than the original Omega-7s. Those men had all been hand-picked by Abel personally and appointed to the project given that he had some modicum of respect for them as combatants. Whereas all of their replacements were plucked at random from the Foundation's other MTFs. As a result, SCP-076-2 would carelessly kill or wound more and more of these reserves during combat missions, hardly distinguishing between friend and foe. But despite this, the O5 Council refused to discontinue the Omega-7 project, viewing these as acceptable losses and letting the success rate of Abel's missions justify the depletion of their other mobile task forces. Under Abel's leadership and the command of the O5 Council, Omega-7 would become the Foundation's primary rapid response unit and the most deployed task force for dangerous field operations. And working for the Foundation meant that every field mission was a highly dangerous one. Such was the case during one containment breach, where SCP-682 managed to get free of its acid tank. A rampaging, infinitely adaptable, hard-to-destroy reptile on the loose, slaughtering all in its path was bad enough. But the O5 Council had received intel that there was something more behind this breakout than it first seemed. And so, Abel and the rest of his latest Omega-7 team were sent in to pacify SCP-682. Bursting into the facility, eager to once again be freed from containment and the monotonous, underwhelming experience of training, Abel flew into combat. Drawing black swords from his personal armory, he began to tear through everything and everyone in his path. Unfortunately for the Foundation personnel on site, this also meant they were subject to Abel's relentless wrath. As if running away from SCP-682 wasn't bad enough, fleeing research staff were quickly met with the swing of SCP-076-2's weapons and removed from the premises in a brutal fashion. Still, this meant little to Abel, and even less to the O5 Council. As far as they were concerned, even their own staff were just collateral damage, more acceptable losses justified by Abel's perfect record for successful, high-risk, high-reward field missions. However, that perfect record was about to be tarnished for good. You see, this containment breach wasn't your average SCP-682 escape attempt. 
It was instead a situation that had been meticulously planned and carried out for one purpose. This breach was intended specifically to draw Abel out. Since he had become the SCP Foundation's primary weapon and response to danger in the field, a particularly devious third party had begun to take note. The Chaos Insurgency, a splinter faction that began its life as an off-the-books black ops unit for the Foundation themselves, had been monitoring Abel's deployment by the O5 Council. In this universe, their origin was the same as in ours, and the insurgency took a certain disdain to seeing an anomalous individual carrying out the kind of operations their group had been formed to undertake for the Foundation. Additionally, the use of SCP-076-2 as a personal attack dog by the O5 Council is hypocrisy. The insurgency believed in the practical application of anomalies, rather than locking them up and keeping them contained. And it was for this belief that they had been vilified by the Foundation. And yet, here was the same organization sending Abel on missions, with no care for the harm he caused. And so, as a result, the Chaos Insurgency had conducted an operation to break into the Foundation, free SCP-682, and send the hard-to-destroy reptile on a rampage, also they could take their shot at Abel. Being ambushed by a group of Chaos Insurgency operatives on his way to engage SCP-682, Abel was admittedly caught by surprise. But by now, his combat prowess was second to almost nobody else in the world. The insurgents dogpiled on Abel, unleashing every ounce of firepower they had brought to bear on the immortal warrior. The ensuing firefight destroyed an entire wing of the Foundation facilities, explosive weapons being detonated in the hopes that the insurgency could subdue Abel. All the while, SCP-076-2 shrugged off the oncoming damage, catching rockets that were launched at him and throwing them back in the direction of the Chaos Insurgents. It was a bloodbath. Nearly the entire Omega-17 that had accompanied Abel and provided him with fire support were lying dead. The same could also be said for the Insurgency's forces too, though, with each of them being gradually felled by the warrior's many weapons. But by this point, Abel was approaching exhaustion and there was still one more enemy left standing. It had been unfurling destruction all on its own, angrily devouring the few Foundation personnel that were left, and now the scaly form of SCP-682 came lumbering around the corner. The battle was brutal. In this universe, Abel and the hard-to-destroy reptile had never crossed paths before, but SCP-682 could smell the difference in Abel's physiology, his innate ability to resist damage and resurrect time and time again. The creature already held disdain for anything and everything living, and so presented with a man who technically couldn't stop living, SCP-682 entered an unstoppable rage state, taking the exhausted Abel down with ease. But losing in a grudge match against SCP-682 wasn't quite as bad as things were about to get for Abel. Reviving inside of his stone sarcophagus, the ancient warrior was confused. The Foundation were letting him out. It had been a long time, years even, since he had last died, even temporarily. Over the course of all of his Omega-7 missions, he hadn't needed to reappear back inside SCP-076-1 for quite a considerable while, and now that he had, a very large seed of doubt had been sown. The O5 Council were furious, just as angry at SCP-076-2's apparent failure as Abel was. The perfect operational track record of their top anomalous asset was now tarnished. The question started to spread through the Council members. If their sword-wielding, virtually invulnerable secret weapon wasn't as effective as they had previously thought, then what was the use of continuing to deploy Abel? And so began a debate within the O5 Council upon what was to be the fate of SCP-076-2. In this universe, he had served the Foundation well, but a weapon that is only effective even 90% of the time still leaves a margin of error. It was that risk, that potential for error, knowing that Abel wouldn't always succeed in his missions, that caused the O5 Council to reconsider his applications as a field operative. There were some in the Council who argued that this was a highly specific, isolated incident. The Chaos Insurgency had specifically engineered the SCP-682 escape as a way to draw Abel out, after all. Just because he failed this time did not indicate a pattern of failure, but this argument was eventually shot down, especially when the Foundation's Ethics Committee decided to throw in their two cents. 
they demanded Abel's status as a field agent be revoked and levied for the immediate disbanding for the Omega-7 project. Pulling replacements for that task force from other MTFs at the Foundation had left them with a significantly depleted reserve of troops. And then came the argument about just how acceptable the losses were when Abel was let loose. A decision was ultimately made to, for at least the moment, rescind SCP-076-2's field operative privileges and suspend any further development of or recruitment into Omega-7. However, there was one crucial factor that nobody on the Council had taken into consideration when they made their verdict, and that was how badly Abel would react to the news. As you may have already predicted, Abel was furious to hear he would be held in containment until further notice. His anger stemmed not from his defeat at the jaws of SCP-682, but at how quick the Foundation seemingly was to question his combat prowess. He lost one battle out of hundreds, thousands even, and all of a sudden the O5 Council were going to lock him away, all because of one defeat? You dare?! Abel bellowed when he was given the news. I am the greatest warrior on this planet, and have been made a pawn by your Foundation. I give you my strength, my skill, and the moment I falter, you turn your back on me? You dare! You dare! I will show you what real power looks like! Overcome with rage, it didn't take long for Abel to force his way out of containment. He'd been active as a field agent within the Foundation for so long now that he had long since figured out a way to escape his underwater prison before the emergency containment measures had a chance to stop him. As he broke free, he made sure to take down plenty of security staff along the way, and to make matters worse, he didn't stop there. Before long, Abel was on a warpath against the SCP Foundation. Every few days, reports would come in of a massacre at a Foundation facility. Security footage recovered from the wreckage after each incident would show Abel arriving primed for battle, a sword in each hand. By the time he left after his brutal, remorseless attack, he'd be drenched in the blood of the entire site's personnel. The Foundation had little in its once huge arsenal to fight back with. Given the number of MTF agents reassigned to Omega-7, their forces were far more limited, if not almost depleted. They dispatched detachments to clean up the wake of Abel's destruction, but not one squad sent after the anomalous warrior came back alive. Part of the problem was, the Foundation couldn't predict where Abel would show up next, or which of their sites he knew about and was planning to hit. From their perspective, his attacks were spontaneous, the result of rage at the Foundation, but without any premeditated plan in mind. And that was exactly what Abel wanted them to think. By seeming to attack at random, he was, therefore, able to cover the true intention behind each engagement. He was looking for something. During his considerable time leading Omega-7, he had heard about a machine that could improve anything placed inside of it, SCP-914, better known as the Clockworks. And before long, Abel found what he was looking for. By the time the Foundation realized what the Unstoppable Warrior's plan was, it was already too late. Abel was storming into the facility that housed SCP-914 with no intention of leaving until he'd used it. The Foundation had banned testing of biological matter within the clockworks, but Abel wasn't beholden to their rules anymore. In fact, he barely was when he'd worked with them before. Cutting down guards and researchers, survivors fleeing in terror, Abel stepped up towards the mass of gears and cogs, the clockwork components that made up SCP-914. He wasted no time setting the machine to very fine. With this setting, the clockworks would take whatever was in the input booth and improve it, usually by giving it anomalous properties, or in the case of Abel, by giving him further anomalous properties. Stepping inside, the whir of machinery drowned out the emergency alarms as Abel reached his goal to become the ultimate warrior, the embodiment of the very concept itself. Racing to the scene, a chopper cleared the smoke as it approached. Under an emergency executive order from the O5 Council, the few surviving remnants of the Foundation's mobile task forces had been combined into a singular strike team. There were not many left. Considering how many others from their units had been previously siphoned into Omega-7, only to die as collateral damage in the team's missions with Abel. Remember, SCP-076-2 is a priority target! The field commander barked, while the MTF strike team held their guns nervously aboard the aircraft. Primary objective is to neutralize him by any means! 
Reports indicate that he may be trying to access SCP-914, so be advised! An almighty explosion boomed through the airborne vehicle, engulfing the cockpit in flames. Mayday! 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 Chopper 1 has been hit! We're going down! The commander radioed to Foundation Command. Everyone brace yourselves for impact! The helicopter spiraled out of the air, crashing to the ground in a twisted hunk of metal. The surviving members of the strike team scrambled out of the wreckage, hauling the more badly wounded out of the ruined aircraft. CONTACT! Someone yelled in horror. ENEMY CONTACT BEHIND US! The remaining Foundation foot soldiers turned and drew their weapons, opening fire on something suspended a few feet in the air above them. A hail of gunfire rang out, as the team opened fire the second they saw who it was. It was Abel, and he was flying. Floating above them, his hair whipped in the wind, the oncoming storm of bullets seemed to ricochet off his skin. In actuality, they weren't even hitting him, melting away before they could make contact. They might as well have been firing pea shooters for how little effect their guns had. The barrage only stopped when one of the strike team launched a short-range rocket at the newly refined warrior. It detonated, but when the smoke from the blast cleared, Abel was still hovering in the air without so much as a scratch. My turn he announced. Reaching into his pocket dimension, Abel pulled something out. Not a weapon, not yet. Instead, it was a formless, dark, shadowy mass that moved like liquid metal, reacting to the movement of his hand. As he drew the substance out, it reformed, seemingly at Abel's command. And it wasn't just swords he could create now. Drawing on his experiences from his Omega-7 missions, any weapon that Abel had previously seen or could think of, he now had at his disposal. The strike team looked up in horror, as a veritable swarm of black, non-reflective constructs hovered in the air on either side of Abel, each one in the shape of a rocket. Flinging both arms towards the Foundation troops, Abel sent his new creations raining down on them. The strike team turned heel and fled for their lives, although none of them got very far. Abel's rockets engulfed the area around them in a volley of explosions, leaving not a single thing standing. He had just effortlessly built an airstrike from virtually thin air and thrown it at the Foundation's last remaining MTF agents. And he wasn't done there. With his newfound powers, Abel's campaign of destruction swept the entire world. In a last act of desperation, the SCP Foundation offered freedom to any anomaly that permanently took down SCP-076-2. They all flooded out of containment to take their shot. The Plague Doctor. The Shy Guy. The Spectre but they barely slowed Abel down. His new constructs were devastating weapons, taking the form of not just blades, but projectiles of every size and shape, all of them lethal. Before long, Abel had lain waste to the entire Foundation, but still, he wanted more. SCP-914 hadn't just improved Abel's existing anomalous powers and granted him the ability to fly at supersonic speeds. In doing so, it had amplified his range, too. He loathed the human race, and sought to absolutely decimate every single living thing. No one could best him in combat now, and in his mind, twisted by anger, not one of them was worthy of his respect. He tore planes apart with his bare hands, smashed tanks to pieces, and leveled entire cities with his unlimited weapons. It took a few years, maybe a decade at the most, but by the end of it, Abel sat atop a pile of billions upon billions of bones. With his refined abilities, he had done something unthinkable, committed omnicide. He had killed everyone in the world. Of course, this was indeed another world, one different to ours. Luckily here, our version of Abel is still locked up underwater, but somewhere out there, there is an Abel who is watching the sun rising over an entirely dead world, his world. Want to own an SCP of your own? Go to scpswag.com for premium anomalous merchandise. Now to see the result of more anomalous experiments with the clockworks, go and check out what if SCP-096 was put inside SCP-914, and SCP-914, what did you put in it? For more clockworks-related stories.